morning, everybody. Welcome to the House Committee on Government Operations and Military Affairs. This Wednesday, February 7th, we are picking up our work with a new draft of our six um, miscellaneous ethics bill. So, Mr. Devlin, would you like to find us here? I think it might make sense to um, maybe start with the summary and then we can kind of dig into the, the language itself. That sounds good for you. Thank you for having me, Chair McCarthy. Uh, for the record, my name is Tim, Legislative Council. For you, uh, the committee members will have draft 2.7 of the committee bill, um, how to do with miscellaneous ethics, uh, for reference, this is 24 0229, and bill summary as well. And the bill summary um, now includes um, a little bit extra information on about existing disclosure requirements in the front page. And then anything that has changed since um, draft 1.4 that the committee was reviewing in previous weeks um, has been um, uh, indicated in green text on the summary. So it's easy just to kind of um, skim for, uh, hopefully easy to skim for exactly what has been updated here. Uh, Chairman McCarthy, would you like me to um, work my way systematically through the summary to hit all aspects of the bill again, or really just what's uh, been updated since. Yeah, so I think it would probably make sense because we've been focused on many other things to just do a, a quick high level on, on on what's in the whole draft, because I think many of us may have kind of, you know, forgotten that certain elements, but uh, maybe the review will not be a waste of time. <laughs> okay. I'll just start off very high level with the purpose of the bill. This uh, bill proposes to one require that certain county officers both running for and holding office file fan financial disclosures two modify disclosure requirements for certain elected official officers, both running for and holding office three creating penalties for delinquent disclosures for candidates and for state office, county office, and state senators and state representatives, for granting uh, the state ethics commission powers to investigate, hold hearings, and issue warnings, reprimands, and recommended actions. Let's see, uh, five, create a full time uh, exempt legal counsel position in the state ethics commission and reclassify the executive director of the state ethics commission from a part time to a full time exempt state employee. And finally, add a member to the State Ethics Commission to be appointed by the Vermont League of Cities and Towns. <laughs> Jumping to the top of page two of the summary, part one of the bill pertains to candidate financial disclosure requirements. Section one and uh, amends, we now turn to the elections title, uh, Title 17 BSA 2414, titled uh, Candidates for State and Legislative Office Disclosure Form. And this will require candidates for county offices to submit financial disclosure forms in addition to candidates for state offices in the General Assembly. Here, and this is an updated uh, portion of the language, county office will mean assistant judge of the Superior Court, high bailiff, judge of probate, sheriff, and state's attorney. So those elected uh, appointed offices. Right. So, so this updated draft has all of the elected county offices on the candidates for those offices are included in the financial disclosure. So we're just capturing everybody who's running your office for those county seats in addition to us and statewide candidates, et cetera. Right. Thank you. Remind me where the appointed folks lie. Do they have um, something within the, another statute, sorry. The appointed folks, um, I was thinking about a little bit more, and considering this is for candidates, um, this is the elections title where candidates would be running. That would make more sense. They wouldn't be, off, they're not running, so they wouldn't be queued to offer disclosures. Uh, During the course, letters. yeah, right. Um, the state officers, um, and this is in part five, do have to uh, provide annual uh, disclosures. Okay. However, um, the county level appointed positions. Um, I'll double check. I don't think that actually applies to those folks in this current draft, though, but I can look into that. Look. So, do you not think county appointed officials, if there are even any, have to file disclosures? 
Not all of the appointed uh, county officials, really, their duties don't pertain to fiscal matters. Um, to what degree that matters or not, leave to the committee to determine whether they'd like to ask for disclosures from those individuals. But um, county clerks kind of deal with recounts. Um, uh, let's see, the county officer is actually a contracted job, interestingly. Um, <clears throat> it's not actually a held position, it's a uh, kind of task out. Um, let's give the other uh, um, county positions. I can certainly look into that, though. If you'd like to know. Okay, thanks. I just wasn't sure who was covered under this county um, umbrella. So it's not appointed people. Section A of, sorry, subsection A of section one uh, will require these, uh, those disclosures to include, and I have uh, seven bullets here. One, sources of personal income of more than $5,000 from an employer. This is in current statute. Two, if self-employed, uh, sources of personal income from, two sub bullets here, A, the name of any client Tim, could you, I, I, I look to me like you started out on one uh, document. Now you, I don't know where you are. Sorry, I'm at the top of uh, page two of the summary. Of the summary. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so you, I, it, it might've been confusing because you started off with the bullet point from page one and then you skipped the existing duties and the existing yeah. stuff, which is fine because we're, we're talking about everything that's in the bill, but. Just want to, that's a good point of just orienting everybody. So we're we're on the top of page two of the summer. And thanks. Apologies for that. And if uh, any uh, committee members would like me to dive into the actual language themselves, I'd be happy to. I can refer everybody where it's at. Um, subsection A, uh, let's see. So the second item that will be required for disclosure forms if self-employed, sources of personal income from A, the names of any client whom the candidate knows has business before any municipal or state office, department, or agency during the previous 12 months, provided that the disclosed information is not confidential information. So there's two things in green there, two qualifying um, aspects that the candidate is aware of, um, that their client had uh, business before uh, municipal or state office department agency within the previous 12 months. And also there's a confidentiality element to it now where if they're otherwise uh, prohibited from disclosing that, they would be exempt from doing so in that context. B, if self-employed sources of personal income from the names of clients from whom the candidate has received $10,000 or more in the previous 12 months, provided that the disclosed information is not confidential information. So again, that qualifier for confidential information. The third disclosure requirement, and this has been updated in the bill, is membership and position on any board or commission in the prior 12 months. So I'm gonna pause on that one in particular. Um, so we, in the last draft of the bill, we're going from the current requirement, which is that um, Boards and commissions that receive uh, or uh, any state funds, so organizations that receive state funds. If you're on a board, you have to report that already. And then we, uh, the su original suggested language said, in addition to that, any boards that might advise on the spending of state funds. So if you're on an advisory council, for instance, and I think there was some confusion around that. We had a committee discussion about it, and my recommendation to uh, legislative council was, let's just say if, if you're on a board, just report that you're on a board, that just make it easy, like have the, the statute just, um, so any board or commission that you're on that has to do with uh, state spending, so that we've simplified the language significantly in the draft. Uh, the next requirement for disclosure is number four, Loans made to a company if the candidate owned more than 10% of the company and if the loan was not commercially reasonable and made in the ordinary course of business. 
This has not changed since the last update or since the last version. Next five companies in which the candidate. Just to, like to clarify, it, it, and I know it hasn't changed. So loans made to a company, the candidate puts ten percent more. And if so, does that trigger disclosure with the and if? Let me pull up the actual language here. So this is uh, the bill. We're on page three. Um, okay. Uh, so this is three B. It's the if that's thrown. Yeah. Yes. And that'd be uh, details of a loan uh, to a company in Division A of C of not commercially uh, that is not commercially usable loan. Uh, okay. So it would have to be. Uh, Owned by um, a ten percent in ownership interest, and then also uh, it'd be and so it'd be both the ten percent and if it's commercially unreasonable. Sorry, I'm not sure if that. So who decides if it's not commercially reasonable? That um, the idea of commercially reasonable loan um, is not spelled out here. Mm -hmm. Because it's not spelled out, um, it could be litigated by the courts. We could introduce further detail as to what exactly is meant by that. I'd have to check to see if um, there's a broader understanding throughout this title of what is commercially reasonable in financial disclosures, or perhaps if it has been litigated. But I could certainly look into that. Come on. That would be yeah. yeah, so I will, I'm going to come back to this when we have executive director Sivert, uh, because I feel like this particular provision has, I, I think it, it's gotten a lot of attention and I'm not exactly sure how valuable it, it is. It seems like a pretty rare thing, but we're in, in any of these provisions, my understanding is we're talking about what's gonna be on the form and every single candidate is gonna have to make a disclosure and if they fail to report something, it, it's not as if the ethics commission is like investigating the veracity of all of the financial disclosure forms. It's an opportunity for candidates to make these things that are required to be on the form public. And if to the best of their knowledge and ability, they in good faith make a disclosure and, and it's not as if there's like an enforcement mechanism that goes through each and everything that's disclosed, it's about what's on the form and does the candidate for office actually you know, truthfully and in good faith fill out the form. <clears throat> I, I don't know that, I, I think sometimes we're getting a little bit like, I, I just wouldn't want any of us to, to get confused when we have legislative counsel say, I'm, I'm not sure that's been litigated. I mean, I don't know that in Vermont really any of these things have been litigated beyond like an advisory opinion about whether a particular thing may or may not have been uh, a conflict of interest or something like that. I mean, it, it... I think this particular case, the definition of commercially reasonable also is going to change depending on the circumstances. So like at some points in time, the commercially reasonable definition might be something that's going to be like commercially reasonable for everyone. And then at other points in time, it might not be commercially reasonable for everyone. But there are references out there to look, but it's really going to be back dependent on the point in time that it happened, what are the circumstances? Um, and so it's not really easy just to say, like, find commercially reasonable, you know, here, because it's always going to be back dependent. But it's something that people can ask us about. And it's also something that we come up while we're doing FAQs or some of the things like the um, financial disclosures is a question which I address in advance as well. So uh, subsection A, I'll continue there, um, will also require disclosure of, let's see, this is uh, bullet five, companies in which the candidate had an ownership or controlling interest in the previous 12 months that, had, that has had business with the state or a municipality. That has not changed since the last draft. Uh, next point has though, and it's indicating green text here, uh, disclosure will require a description, but not amount, of publicly traded assets and interests and trusts valued at $25,000 or more and municipal bonds issued in the state of Vermont of any value. These are to be reported to the best of the candidate's knowledge 
which permits a candidate to describe blind trust and similar assets likely unknown to an investor. So how did that dollar value get changed? What was the basis for changing that and why 25,000? Um, so the original draft had 10. Right. Um, the conversation we had in the committee seemed to suggest that folks felt that that threshold was low. Um, so Representative Waters Evans and I, after listening to the tenor of the conversation here, and I had I think, probably at least implied that we were going uh, to change this in the next draft. There are sort of two big things here, uh, unless I'm mistaken, Tim. One is we increased from the original draft to $25,000 being the threshold, and then we made it really explicit that, it, that you don't have to report the amount. So, Tim, if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, the way this would work now is the form would say, you know, that if you have any individual holdings above $25,000 or interest in a trust, et cetera, that you would have to report the fact of that. Um, so let's say I had, you know, four individual stocks. They might be $200,000 of one stock and $25,000 in one dollar of another stock, $500,000 of another and a million in another holding. And I would just report company A, company B, company C, company D. And all the public would know is that I happen to have holdings in four companies that were in excess in, of likely, you know, in the implications that they're in, in excess of that threshold. So one argument that I'd be really open to is going back to the $10,000 threshold since we've gotten rid of the amount, because then actually the implication is that you have that you may only have $10,000 of that stock. <laughs> but what we were trying to do after the conversation we had here was just make this less tedious. Like, I, I think the implication that anybody's going to be, you know, legislating or doing something that's potentially a conflict of interest because they happen to have a individual stock holding of $10,000 is, that, to me, that's not a super credible implication from all of this. But I think the idea here is that we're just trying to find a reasonable bottom threshold for what that is. And, you know, I personally would be comfortable with 10,000 or 25,000, but we just picked a, a number that was uh, one of the other benchmarks from, you know, other states that was higher than 10,000 because of some of the feedback that we got from the original draft. So is that correct that um, you wouldn't have to report the dollar amount, I think Representative McCarthy was questioning that, so that's that's correct. Um, I didn't follow your your reasoning for going back to the ten thousand. So the idea here is at how much holding, like so, what value of an individual holding? So let's say I have Apple stock, for instance, and I've got fifteen thousand dollars worth of it. I would have a $25,000 threshold, then I wouldn't have to put Apple on the form. The way this is constructed, the language now, it's really clear. I don't have to put the amount regardless. Mm -hmm. But the implication, if I write Apple down to anyone reading the form, because the threshold is $25,000, would be that I have $25,000 or more in Apple. Mm -hmm. So I actually think if one of our concerns is about, you know, candidates for the General Assembly, for instance, feeling like, gosh, do I really want to tell everybody about my personal finances? I actually think there's an argument to be made that if we make the threshold on the lower side and there's kind of more disclosure of, of individual holdings, for instance, but you're saying a lot less about what the value of those things is if the threshold is lower. Because if I write Apple on there and the threshold is 25, then I'm really implying I've got at least 25,000 of that particular individual holding. I totally see what you're saying now. Um, however, you are getting more information out of people if the threshold goes back down to 10,000. And, and frankly, I think 25,000 is pretty low also. Um, so you are getting more information on people, right? If you, if you drop the threshold back down to 10,000. So I guess I still don't really see um, the dollar amounts being relevant, except the lower the dollar amount, the more you find out about a candidate. 
I think, and I've, I know I've said this before, that if you have a candidate who has like 80% of their holdings in a particular company, maybe that's somebody you should be concerned about. Maybe the public needs to know that kind of information because that's almost like holding, that's almost like having a controlling interest in a company. It's a similar concept in my mind. I mean, you may not, if you have 80% of your holdings in Microsoft, you're not really a controlling interest in that company, but it shows that that's something that you're really interested in and really trying to make profit on. I just, I don't really like these dollar amounts. I don't think they're, they're truly relevant to what you're trying to get at because folks who have $10,000 in a stock, I mean, at, at some of the stock prices that are out there, they're hundreds of dollars per share. So you could get up to ten thousand or even twenty five thousand dollars pretty quickly. So, right. And what does that tell you about that person? It, that person doesn't have a controlling interest in the company, likely, um, unless it's a very small company with very low value of stock. So I don't think you're getting the kind of information that you really want out of this. You really want to know if somebody's going to be sitting here in my seat at this table making decisions based on their personal holdings. And I really don't think this type of picky threshold is going to tell you that kind of information. So I think we'll maybe put a pin in this. I know it's been like one of the big topics of conversation. So when we have Director Sivert back up, we'll hear from her and TJ about sort of the, the rationale behind the thresholds and what we're really getting at. Because I think it's, it's what we keep coming back to as people who are candidates ourselves and you know, we and people uh, who run in the future, if, if we pass this, will be asked to make these disclosures. I think it's, it's really hard for us to step out side of this and say, hey, what is a what is a reasonable amount of disclosure that we make so that the public can have faith that we're serving the public interests and not our own financial interests? So it's not just about the controlling interests in a company, it's also about would I be trying to make decisions or is there even the appearance that I might be making decisions in my role as not just a member of the General Assembly, but also you know a secretary in an administration um, that might where there might be a conflict between my personal financial interests, even if I don't have a controlling interest in a company, I may have you know, a significant investment. And if I just disclose what my holdings are from the outset and everybody does that uniformly, the thresholds are more about just setting a reasonable floor for, for when it would be relevant other, you know, and how granular we need to get. Um, and I think there's a very reasonable debate on what, what actually makes sense in terms of that threshold, which is why we, in this new draft, suggested a, a higher floor for that disclosure on individual holdings. Thank you. Before I forget my train of thought, would you mind if I just made a couple of comments? No, go ahead. Thank you. So I really do feel like our position as elected representatives in the General Assembly is quite different than someone who serves, um, like, for instance, as a secretary or commissioner in the executive branch um, because of the decision making power that we have versus those people who are who may be signing contracts. Um, and secondly, I think we should be and this this is really where I'm, where I'm going with this. I think we should be much, much more concerned about who individual state representatives work for in our outside jobs and who our spouses work for in their outside jobs. Because that to me constitutes the biggest conflict of interest in this building, more so than any stock holding or bonds or anything else that anybody could possibly be forced to disclose. I see so many conflicts that maybe they aren't really happening, but the appearance of, and optics are everything in this job. And if you want us to be truly transparent, we should know who works for a company that has a distinct interest in the type of legislation that we're passing in this building. 
So that's what I'm where I'm coming from on this. And this legislation doesn't this legislation to me does not address that issue at all. So it seems in current law, I think one of the reasons we don't see that reference is that right now, any source of income that you or your spouse or domestic partner has that's above five thousand dollars has to be is required to be reported now under current law. Isn't that correct? That is correct, as well as uh, employment, including the employer or business name and address. So currently, like current. the candidate spouse needs to be listed where they get their income from. Yes, uh, the candidate together with his or her spouse or domestic partner that totals more than 5000 Okay, forgive me because it's been two years since an election that I don't remember this. But um, so that's good. That's good to know that that already exists. So that's, that's just why we had to talk about it, just because it's part of the current. I feel like um, none of that is ever really investigated by anybody. You might have to report it, but when we're talking about the powers of investigation and potential censure, that's where it gets a little bit vague to me because I don't, I don't really see that it makes much of a difference that you're disclosing it. So why force people to disclose their personal information if it's not going to be acted on? I, I really do feel that people's financial information is quite personal. And I feel like this is maybe a little bit of overreach um, in terms of people's personal liberty, but that's the position I come from. Um, you know, just by virtue of my political background. <laughs> so that's all I'm going to say. So um, I'm going to make the didn't want to have this out, but I feel like it's it's illustrative of why disclosure is important and sort of how it plays out. So um, when I was first in, in the state house, my employer was disclosed uh, and a bill came up that was about um, the entire net metering policy for the whole state. And I voted for that bill on the floor along with something like 126 other people in the house, right? And um, there was a good government group who complained to the Speaker of the House and the House, House Ethics Panel that I shouldn't have taken that vote. Mm -hmm. And um, the Ethics Committee uh, in the House looked at it and said, there's no conflict of interest here um, because that particular bill, that vote in fact affected everybody. It's the same way that when a teacher votes on an education bill, you know, we have a citizen legislature, we have to be able to come here. And as long as a bill doesn't impact a particular person's business any differently than it would their competitor or a group that they're in, that's not a conflict of interest. But it's really up for the voters to decide. And if I didn't have to disclose who my employer was or who my clients were, um, then there wouldn't be that opportunity for the public to be able to decide for themselves, regardless of what the ethics panel was, whether or not the conflict mattered. And so I think there you're getting at some things representative Hango about how much do we as servants of the public and people who are seeking the public trust need to put our personal information out on the line. So we took some steps a few years ago, you know, starting to require, uh, a little bit more financial disclosure, person and their spouse. We've set up the state ethics commission, a statewide conflict of interest policy for that governs the general assembly and the executive branch. But um, the whole reason we're here with this bill is that we are still, according to a letter that we got, I think we all got, uh, but I got from that same group that actually sent me uh, you know, that complained about my vote on the net metering bill 10, 11 years, 10 years ago. Um, that same group is saying, pass this bill because in the interests of the public, they, they want the public to know uh, more about us than we currently disclose. And so finding out, you know, it's our job here to figure out where those lines are. Um, and it is really hard. I mean, it, and it feels like a lot more. And I think, um, the more transparent we are, you know, to a reasonable degree, 
Like, I really don't think that we should have to disclose our 1040s. And that's why that's not on the table here today. I think, you know, the ethics commission didn't put that in their recommendations for the general assembly. Um, but when you start to get up to running for statewide office, we already, you know, decided mm -hmm. that that was going to be a reasonable disclosure. So, um, these are all really good conversations to have about what the, le the level of specificity is. Yeah, I really appreciate you bringing up that example because, yes, we did all, all get that letter, and I don't totally agree with those folks. So, <laughs> I'm a little bit of an outlier there, and I'm sure they would hope that I agreed with them 100%, but I don't really. So, But I do appreciate you giving a real-life example of that, and that that is one of my frustrations here is that probably someone in that position should have just recruited themselves from the vote on, what is it, Rule 75 or something like that. Yes, and, yes. and honestly, I'm not saying that to you personally, anybody in that situation, but I know that the state ethics group it's, or the ethics group here in the General Assembly said that it was okay. Uh, I don't necessarily agree with that either, <laughs> but there's a lot that I don't agree with in this building. So we'll just move on. So I totally understand. Um, so I have a few hands up. Let me go to represent Waters Evans. Uh, thanks. I just um, wanted to first acknowledge that it, 100% it feels strange to have to disclose something that's really private and personal just in order to do something that seems like you're also giving up a lot of things that are private and personal to be here for a lot of people, right? Um, the, but the other thing I wanted to mention is I just remembered it's there's, if you look at, um, if you look on our, our witness list and you look up um, Christina Sivret underneath her name with all the documents, there's one from January 24th. Um, that's a state financial disclosure chart. And it's interesting to look at because um, it, it it breaks it down every state and what they ask mm -hmm. for from different. Do you remember seeing that? Mm -hmm. I had kind of forgotten about it. So some states are no, but then some of them are a thousand dollars. So in that context, 25 seems pretty high, I think appropriately high in this case, but um, it, they're pretty low, like 1,000 and 5,000 for all the states that do have disclosure limits for investments set or thresholds for investments. So just for some context. Yeah, I think if you look at a lot of those states, they're larger in population than we are, and they have more people to, <laughs> to <laughs> gather candidates from. We're such a small state. Yeah. Um, and I, it, it feels more personal, like a lot of people who run for office across the state, I know who they are. Do I really need to know that personal information about them, I don't know. But like if I lived in Arizona, for instance, I wouldn't know a lot of those people who are running for state representative there. So it would be less personal and more just like a business thing. I think we try to do a lot of things in this building that, and this is something else I've really been wanting to say, we try to do a lot of things in this building that are like other states. We follow the model of Colorado, Oregon, Washington State, California a lot. Those states are so much bigger than us population-wise. We can't, we can't really compare ourselves to them. So I know there are some smaller states on this list, and I know what their, that their limits are, what they are. But I'm not one to just say, okay, let's follow the Rhode Island model. For instance, I just want us to be Vermont and be unique and be as transparent as we have to be. I don't want to go overboard. Like one of the questions I asked that um, had to do with um, the number three that we just changed membership and position on any board. It was originally saying any board you serve on that does whatever or receives or receives or makes decisions on money coming from the state. We didn't have any. When I asked for an example of that, nobody could give me an example of one of those boards that we might sit on. But other states have them that just specifically take the money that comes from the state and allocate it around. But we didn't have one of those boards that you would sit on. Do you know what oh, I was talking about? We gave a couple of examples, you know, most specifically the opioid 
settlement funds. That. Okay, that maybe, it, yeah, maybe he, I wasn't he here for that. Three examples during that testimony. That, oh, that was the one that sticks out on okay. the top of my mind, and a really obvious yeah. example. But there were, no, there, there yeah. were a couple. There were, okay. Yeah, $50 million or more, actually. Yeah. More okay, yeah. well, then I will yeah. retract that statement. Just say that I, I'm i not somebody who says, oh, let's just follow the model of another state. I really want to well, think about where, where, we, where we're coming from and why we're ah. going there and why does this apply to <laughs> have we had issues with state representatives who have holdings that need to be disclosed and haven't been. And I don't know of any right now, but if anybody can come up with some specific examples that would help me, that would be great. I think the, the overarching thing is it would be hard to know if we had issues without having a, disclo a disclosure culture that's similar across the board. So how did we get here to wanting to legislate a problem that we haven't figured out except? Uh, so what I would say uh, without getting too deep into the cases. And it may be important for us to perhaps have some more people in, but, and I'm sure Executive Director Sivrick can speak to this, but the State Ethics Commission gets a lot of complaints mm -hmm. um, about perceived conflict of interest or, and um, right now, like we've really been focusing much of our discussion here of, on the disclosure pieces, because I think, you know, there's a lot of agita about how much we have to disclose as a public officials when we run for office or hold office. But um, a big piece of this is for them to have the ability to actually respond, to have a little bit more staff, have the ability to, to have hearings so that they can respond to the complaints that they're already getting, where right now they mostly have to say, you know, we. We don't have the power to dig into that. We, you know, can issue an advisory opinion on if something like that is actually true, whether or not it would be a true conflict. But um, what we're, I think, one of the more important things, even then beyond disclosure, that we're going to hear in the next parts of the bill, is about you know how much power do we want the state ethics commission to have to uh, actually deal with the very real complaints from Vermonters about whether or not officials in you know we've talked a little bit about local that piece we're just kind of beginning in the in the companion language here but on the statewide bill we've had a few years now where we've had a pretty consistent conflict of interest state code of ethics you know people across state government know about it from what we heard from um, jay johnson the general counsel from the administration was that they you know have even some tighter definitions of things than we've contemplated here so um, now that we've all got the experience with that and the state ethics commission is, is in this quandary, um, you know, I, I think it, it might be good for Director Silver to give us some examples of the kinds of things that Vermonters are bringing. Um, Absolutely. But, yeah, but, I would appreciate that. Yeah. I think that's where the, the idea of advancing this is to not only be able to deal with those things, but also to be able to say, Hey, we take ethics seriously in Vermont. And I think you're absolutely right. We need to right size it for Vermont, but beginning of this, I said something to the effect when we first took up this draft language that we've had just kind of a, you know, we all trust good old, you know, person X that's in state government. And, and that's been the Vermont way for a long time. It's just to kind of have trust, but so many officials have violated that trust um, that uh, the reason that other states have gone to this model of kind of a more universal disclosure is to be able to give the public more confidence that everybody's you know, putting their cards on the table about what their interests are. Representative people, go ahead. Um, thank you for that little uh, glimpse. It, it, it identified for me where I am in this process. To some degree. I have no problem whatsoever with the Ethics Commission more investigatory and powers that would allow them to, to respond to a complaint with an actual investigation. Uh, after we cleared up the tax uh, filing issue last time, I have less uh, objection to disclosure for myself. I don't have any really, but 
for my wife and blah, 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 blah. Uh, I still think that's invasive to somebody that really, you know, I'm not married to Christy Brinkley or anything, but uh, it, it might be considered invasive on that level more so than I would want to feel comfortable with. Um, and that's my quandary at this point. Uh, Representative Higley and the Mercury Music. Yeah, I don't know if now's the time, but you know, in just listening to the discussion and stewing over number two, the self employment source of interest. Want to talk about that now, or would you rather wait until the commissioners look at the fund? Or yeah, why don't we um, so that we have time to hear from the commissioner? Why don't why don't we just breeze through the rest of what the the kind of summary changes are, and then I think it would be good for us to to have that discussion with the the commissioner about some of the going back over the rationale for some of these pieces, uh, and then you know if we seem to have consensus on wanting to modify this draft language further, then we can make those uh, requests from each other. That makes sense. Yeah, no, because I just, like I say, stewing over it, I've got some concerns, you know, addressed to, you know, a small self-employed individual like myself. Great. Uh, we're missing... um, just a couple of thoughts. I think that, like, the conflict of interest definition is based in the law. I'm correct. And so there's like a foundation for the reason that it's defined that way. Um, and so it's to me that is like not very arbitrary. Um, and then I just I think like um sometimes in this discussion, the the protective factor um to candidates um of being upfront with all this information is kind of lost in the you know, the moment of potential scrutiny that people have on you and also the chance to build trust with your with the public ahead of time by showing them that you trust them with this information. Um, so I actually think it, it actually like strengthens the um, political process and our ability to run for office. I, I, I appreciate um, the direction that that would go, whatever amount is on there. So Tim, thank you for indulging <laughs> us having committee discussion. I think that was good for us, though, to get some concerns on the table. So we'll, uh, I think we were just um, probably getting into the final changes in part one. So yes. The last item um, that is uh, requiring these disclosure forms would be number seven, mm -hmm. the full name of the candidate's spouse or domestic partner. And that has not changed since the last uh, draft. And um, right here, I'd just like to quickly note that the same disclosure requirements have been added in Section 5 later on the bill for executive officers and some county offices, those, that is, individuals holding office as well. So it's uh, mirrored uh, in two different places. Um, and then subsection C would enable candidates to redact uh, their U.S. individual income tax return form 1040s on that the candidate treats candidate's street address and identifying information and signature of a paid preparer. And again, only state officers, not legislators, have to submit the partially redacted um, 1044. Now that we've added those county officials, we're also not requiring. That right. they're, so it's just statewide candidates or state officers that would have to file. That's the tax return. We have more forms than just the 1040 that people need, right? Um, mm. As far as what's required in the disclosure, or? Well, just as far as filing taxes. Um, depends on the individual, I'm sure. Uh, but the the only reason we're mentioning this is the um, this just happens to be the uh, being modified as far as what can be redacted here. Part two of the bill pertains to in-office financial disclosure requirements, and this is sections two through five. Section two um, will amend three VSA, 1201 definitions by migrating certain definitions uh, from elsewhere in the chapter to the definitions section, kind of uh, grouping together all the terms to be defined and uh, referenced throughout. 
the chapter. Uh, in particular, it will migrate conflict of interest and public servant. There's a new definition for county officer, uh, meaning an individual holding the office of, oh, sorry, there's a typo on the um, uh, summary, I'll update that. The uh, definition of executive officer has been amended to include deputy under a state officer, which in effect will require annual disclosures from deputies of the treasurer, secretary of state, auditor of accounts, and attorney general. In addition to the current agency secretaries and deputies, uh, department commissioners and deputies. So right now under current statute, the deputies of the um, essentially uh, the governor's branch of the executive, um, they're required to file disclosures. This is expanded to the other executives. So, uh, and their deputies there. Okay. The, let's see, this section also has a definition of government conduct regulated by law. Uh, the, let's see, uh, creating or permitting to persist of any unlawful employment practices pursuant to essentially the fair employment laws, uh, including discrimination and sexual harassment. And this will enable the State Ethics Commission to refer and to track complaints uh, of this conduct. Section three, um, again, just migrates that definition of public servants. Section four migrates the definition of conflict of interest in the definition section. Section five, and this has been updated somewhat, will amend three VSA, section 1211, executive officers annual disclosure to require the same additional information to be disclosed for in-office executive officers and county officers as candidates for those offices in section one above. That's why I mentioned earlier. There's that mirroring of disclosure requirements for candidates and those in office, except here, uh, county office uh, in, in this section will mean the high bailiff and state's attorneys. Um, the difference being that um, probate judges and assistant judges will have to offer certain uh, information disclosure while running for office, but not while actually in office. Also to note here that sheriffs were given their own conflict of interest and disclosure requirements in Act 30, which was in Senate Bill 17 last year. And that's why they're not uh, included here. Part three of the bill pertains to delinquent disclosures for candidates for state office, county office, state senate, and state representative. Uh, state senator and state representative. Section six as a new section to be 17 BSA 2415. This is in the elections code uh, to be titled failure to file penalties. And this will be regarding penalties for candidates for state county legislative offices. Uh, who do not properly file their financial disclosures. Subsections A through C will create the penalty structure. Secretary of State will notify the State Ethics Commission, which will issue a notice of delinquency to the candidate. The candidate shall have five working days from the date of the issuance of the notice to cure the delinquency, as properly file those uh, disclosures, after which the candidate will pay $10 a day with a maximum penalty uh, going up to $1,000, possibly. Water sentence. Um, can you go through um, quickly the language in the bill where um, you say uh, penalties for candidates who do not properly file their financial disclosures? Sure. What does properly mean in this context? Sure. Let me. So, section five, uh, oops, sorry. Thanks so here. Is, uh, sorry, bear with me for a moment. It's on page 15 of the bill, failure to file penalties. So let's see, the new language in subsection A of 2415 will state, if any disclosure required of a candidate uh, for those offices is not filed in time, in the time and manner set forth in these other cross reference sections. And those pertain to the uh, dates in which uh, various offices have to file things for um, both um, uh, in various elections. So time, um, is it on time according to the deadlines and the manner set forth really um, gets to the completion of the form for the most part. Um, making sure you don't, uh, the candidate doesn't leave anything blank for the most part. Um, presumably would mean uh, a matter of truthfulness as well to disclose accurate information. Um, as I believe, I can certainly 
triple check and get to the, the uh, explicit language of these cross-reference statutes if you like, but I'm fairly certain they say something. There's somewhere in there um, asking for uh, that the candidate would have to certify that the information being proffered is accurate. That might be already a part of it. I think it is. Yeah. But it doesn't, it's not like there's a penalty if you mistype and you write $14 instead of $15 or something like it's. No, no. no. It would be more like you just didn't hand in your uh, form at all. Got it. And if you did, maybe there's um, much of the information is missing. Um, but whether the statute is silent as to, you know, is it one space or 50% of spaces that are blank? Okay. The, let's see. Um, so section E in part three, uh, and this is section seven, subsection E, sorry, uh, makes any intentionally fraudulent statements on disclosure form uh, a false claim pursuant to uh, 13 PSA 3016, which will be referred to the attorney general or state's attorney for enforcement and uh, represent uh, evidence. This kind of gets to um, uh, maybe a little bit further. This would be egregious conduct here, um, very much intentionally filing uh, inaccurate information with the purpose of deceiving, making a false statement. Senator Cooper. Um, this section seems like it's all pretty much a shall. Um, <clears throat> I know that most of us probably don't hire a professional treasurer, and I know that my personal one has had trouble getting into the state, Secretary of State's a couple of times. Um, where's the oofs, not my fault section in here? The of uh, subsection E, the intentionally fraudulent statements? No. Or the a timing filing? Just the filing date, like dead time. Sure. Um, the, you're right, it is a, um, it's best to think of it in a shall as a candidate's will be required to um, submit the materials by the certain deadline um, or then be subject to the $10 day deadline after the certain process is followed there. Um, I think what might alleviate Representative Cooper's concern is the process that has to be followed for that. So could you just, sure. you know, we might even want to look at the, the bill yes. language itself as opposed to the summary to, to lay that out. So the, this is on page 15 of the bill. The process here, uh, to Chair McCarthy's point, is that the Office of Secretary of State um, will receive the information. They'll be the ones to uh, kind of clock if something is, hasn't been turned in by a certain deadline. They'll inform the State Ethics Commission, um, and it, it will be up to the State Ethics Commission to send out a notice informing the candidate that they haven't provided the reps, uh, requisite forms. There will be a period in which the uh, candidate will be like, oh, okay, let me go ahead and submit that. And if it's submitted um, and uh, everything is, the information is complete on that, um, then there's no penalty uh, levied at that point. Um, and the uh, delinquency will be considered cured. There's a there's Secretary of State says here here are the 50 candidates that haven't submitted a form by the initial deadline. State Ethics Commission provides a notice to those candidates, and then from the time they get the notice, the candidates have in the current draft bill five days to cure that delinquency before any penalty can be assessed. And then after that, um, the State Ethics Commission can reduce or waive any penalty imposed. Tim, I think that's the bottom of 16. Yes. That, um, yep, that's right. That's in um, subdivision four. The commission may reduce or waive any penalty um, let's see. if there's demonstrated good cause um, as determined by the state ethics commission and their sole discretion. Yeah, my point is much simpler, I think, than that. Yeah. Yes. It, it, my recollection of what has happened in the past is that it, you know, everybody sort of waits until 
what did properly classify as the last minute, and then something goes fluid with the Secretary of State's filing system. It's set up basically that now you automatically would get referred to Epics to do the notice and everything else. And if you don't happen to have access to JP real quickly, you're in that loop. I don't know that that's necessarily cognizant of sometimes the systems that we have in Vermont don't work the way they're supposed to. Yeah, so, so I think actually the in the drafting of the bill, um, I wasn't too involved in, in this language, so we can hear from Director Sifrid and I know Representative Waters Evans was helping to shepherd some of this into draft language, but the idea here is not that I think we're trying to create a mechanism where people get punished. It's that right now, candidates don't take the filing seriously. They just don't. <laughs> and like, I understand that sometimes the technology doesn't work and that's why there's a cure period. There's the opportunity if you're really experiencing trouble that you can say, hey, State Ethics Commission, I just, the IT issues that the Secretary of State's office is having are crazy. And the other thing is, if you don't pay the fine, like what, you know, it's it's really in the end, it's sort of public shaming and embarrassment and for a candidate who doesn't file. But right now, there's just no mechanism of enforcement at all for the filings. And so there are a lot of candidates who just don't take it seriously. Um, and and that is frustrating to so many Vermonters. I mean, I, we're going to have the Secretary of State's office come in on this tomorrow afternoon. And I think they'll tell us how many times they get complaints from people about like, I can see that this candidate for Office X has lawn signs and advertising and all this stuff. And I go to look for who's funding their campaign and they haven't filed their disclosures. It's just like, it's infuriating to Vermonters. And it makes me feel as somebody who really does my best to file on time, like, what am I doing this for if half of the other candidates in the state aren't taking it seriously? Representative Chase, go ahead. Uh, I mean, uh, from, from my part, uh, my second campaign, I didn't do any fundraising or, or spending, so I didn't know I had to file. Um, and basically skipped an entire election. So um, I, I, I found out that that's not yeah. how that is worded. Um, can, in, as part of this, can we have the, um, the the Secretary of State, everybody who's filed and going to be on a primary or whatever ballot um, gets a letter from the Secretary of State saying, here are the obligations, what you need to do? Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk to them about that. <laughs> I mean, I, I kind of feel like at a certain point, like you just go on the Secretary of State's website, there's a handbook for a candidate. It explains it very clearly. Um, and so I, I want to I hold that thought and we should talk to um, whether we hear from um, Lauren or Will tomorrow. I'm not, I can't remember 100%, but we should talk to the Secretary of State's office about that. If I was going to guess, I'm guessing that what they would say is like at a certain point, it kind of needs to be on like, if you're running for public office that you at least we'll visit our website and see what we say you have to do. So that's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't want to put people in a situation where there's a big league standing up in front of the fish and game club and one of the wise ass people from somewhere stands up and says, uh, can you tell me how many times you've been referred to the S? Something simple like this. Takes on a life uh, unless it's been somebody says that doesn't happen. I guess my thought when you said that is this is that I don't believe, as Representative McCarthy just said, I don't believe that this is being put in place in order to punish or expose or or embarrass or, or make vulnerable a candidate. I think part of part of the job is, yeah, people might stand up at a public meeting and say, hey, I saw that you have over $100,000 in Google stock. Why are you voting on this? That's a part of our job. It's part of our life mm -hmm. doing this job. And I think if, if I think saying that we shouldn't be held responsible for our own behavior and our, our own uh, compliance with laws is should be put aside for fear of, of people calling us on it. And if I may walk over with 
for the tonight. I'm not going that far. That's not my concern. Yeah. I agree with the chair that it's uh, tantamount to bad guru if you don't file a, a form and such. But this seems to just be an opportunity for people who you know, want to file something on the web that says uh, you've right. been referred four or five times and there's no, no clarification of why. Well, am I wrong, Chair McCarthy, that that there wouldn't be a list published of just random these people are being reported for an ethics violation without saying people <laughs> filed late? Like there's a it, it's not just like a generic it's unaddressed at this point. So we have two different entities, um uh commission and ethics commission and the Secretary of State's office. Um, I'm not sure. This bill does not require the commission to post anything. I am not sure that the uh, Secretary of State's office publishes a list of late recipients. It may appear they would have a database that would be searchable that said have a line where people would expect to find something at a certain point in time where it may appear blank. That would be an indicator. Uh, these are public records as well. So if there's no list, they would still be subject to the Public Records Act to the degree which that, um, you know, uh, the information may be partially or entirely without in full is subject to the, the exceptions in 1 PSA 317C. Um, but this bill doesn't um, require either the Secretary of State or uh, Ethics Commission to publish a list of offenders but it is not confidential, quote unquote, information and can be probably easily discerned. Right. There's also the issue of this is a, this would be a negative uh, record, right? Because it's the the problem is there's an absence of record being produced here. Yeah, the easiest way to deal with it is just to, to file your filing, and if you miss it, you've got a cure period. And if you're really having trouble, you can ask the state ethics commission. You know, give them good cause, and they can say. Oh, I'm not going to levy any. Yeah, and this is a, for my part anyway, a continuous train of thought that there was a book in a place where something didn't go the way it was supposed to, and then all of a sudden you're in this blue book. It doesn't happen often, I imagine, but it certainly happens. Well, I think that the, the, challenges that candidates have faced with the campaign fi finance system does create issues. I mean, that that's, there are times when it's worked great for almost every filing candidate. And I think we should ask the secretary of state's office tomorrow. I know that they've made improvements to that over the years and, you know, kind of how often are they, what percentage of candidates has trouble filing and how long does it take to fix those issues? Cause what we may want to really think about is, is the cure window too short? You know, should it be two weeks instead of five days or something like that? And on the other hand, I think there's a public interest during, especially during the end of the campaign, <laughs> yeah, and yeah. getting that information <laughs> quickly as possible. And we don't want to just extend that indefinitely. So those are, you know, those are policy decisions that we can make. And we've got a draft in front of us. Be like an on year, off year. And... <laughs> oh, no, yeah, yeah. Yeah. no, no, we should make it one consistent. You know, it's, <laughs> is, that a, is that a too cute by half? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, I'm going to make this easier by making it way more complicated. I feel like that's yeah. an expression people use. Uh, okay. right. Yes, 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 yes. No. All right. I, um, to <laughs> executive director, so do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I was just going to say um, one is a plug. So we now have an online filing system for executive officers. The so Secretary of State's office can use for financial disclosures for candidates. So um, I sent around the links if you want to take a look. You can see how easy it could be to file online. Um, but just a second, we're not going after, if you were to miss a filing deadline, where are we usually get a list of people who are actually late? And then somebody have that five day and kids work with day notice. And so if you have a reason why you couldn't, you couldn't file on time, that's perfectly you know, acceptable. That's something that we're going to say, okay, as long as you get the notice within those five days, as long as you can do it, then you're all good. If for some reason you're stopped from doing it because of the technology, you didn't know, malfunction somewhere else, then again, that's going to be a reason why you couldn't do it and you wouldn't be fine during that time. What have we got left that we haven't hit, Mr. Devlin? 
Part four of the bill has to do with expansion of the State Ethics Commission's powers. And this is um, where most of the new ink appears in here. Um, the following sections will expand the commission's powers, uh, enabling it to investigate, hold hearings, and make non-binding recommendations. These uh, sections have been updated to provide additional detail process. And you can see there's a lot of green text indicating what has changed. Um, I will skip down to section 10, which adds a new section regarding investigations. It enables the committee to investigate alleged unethical conduct occurring within the prior uh, two years. It's a built-in statute of limitations there, uh, with or without receiving a complaint. Investigations must conclude within three months and it may result in an investigation report and subsequent commission hearing if there is uh, finding that probable cause um, to believe, sorry, that there is probable cause to believe that the public servant's conduct constitutes an unethical violation. <laughs> new section 11 uh, adds a new section uh, regarding hearings before the commission. This enables the commission to hold public hearings for the purpose of gathering evidence and testimony and making determinations if liked, if wanted. Both the public servant and any complainant will be afforded an opportunity to be at the hearing, uh, present evidence, respond to evidence, and argue on all issues related to the alleged unethical misconduct. Section 12 will add a new section having to do with warnings, reprimands, and recommended actions. This enables the commission to issue those warnings, reprimands, reprimands and recommended actions within 30 days of the last hearing. Uh, the recommendations may include, um, not be limited to, facilitated mediation, additional training and education, referrals to counseling and wellness uh, support or other remedial actions, and just like to uh, emphasize that these would be only recommendations. Section 13, as a new section having to do with procedure and rulemaking, this directs the commission to adopt rules regarding procedural and evidentiary aspects of the investigations and hearings. It also grants the commission um, the power to issue subpoenas and administer oaths in connection with any investigation or hearings. Type of about correct. Section 14 will add a new section uh, regarding um, records and confidentiality. Uh, and these records relating to the commission's handling of complaints, alleged unethical conduct, investigations and proceedings, are exempt from the Public Records Act and shall be kept confidential. That's the starting place. And then there's exceptions to that um, being investigation reports uh, in a hearing, sorry, if a hearing is found to be warranted, that is if there's probable cause determined to be the case. Uh, two, evidence produced in the open and public portions of the commission hearings. I should just note that the commission hearings would be subject to the open meetings law, so there's possibility for those uh, uh, to go into executive session in certain circumstances already spelled out in law. And three, would uh, additional records exempted from uh, uh, confidentiality, that is would be public, would be any warnings, reprimands, or recommendations issued by the commission and supporting documents uh, as determined by the commission, so that end product. And I'd like to note here that there is no appeals process, namely because there's no binding final decision no expulsion from office or fine or loss of property, right, et cetera. And that is really that there's nothing to appeal. Thank you. That last note completely threw me. What do you mean there's no binding final decision? Does the commission not issue a decision on their hearings? They may issue a determination, uh, but the form of which it is that it's a recommendation it doesn't have to be followed by the um public official. Uh, so if they say, um, what were the, uh, here the, so if there's, um, well, an issue or a reprimand um, is just a declaration. And then a recommendation, uh, should it be, let's say, we recommend that there be facilitated mediation between the parties to hash out um, the differences and find reconciliation on the matter. Um, Neither party has to actually participate in that. They don't want to. Why do all this if you're not going to come to a conclusion that somebody did something really egregious and needs to take action to rectify that? Yeah, so I think I'd like to have Executive Director Silver talk about the, the sort of virtue of, of doing this. 
great. If you want to do it now, it's great. You might as well just do it in context and kind of. I think the idea is that there would be there would be findings that would be based the recommendations on, so there would be a confusion. And so right now, I think the issue, and a lot of people come to us looking for impartiality, and so what we do is we make a third party impartiality to review the case. And again, we're groundworking on behalf of the complainant, our master's of company, working on behalf of the state to come up with a finding, with a recommendation to do an objective investigation, and then come up with findings and recommendations that could then be implemented by someone with the power to enforce. Should they so choose? So, for instance, if if there was a complainant who was bringing a complaint against an executive branch official, a secretary, deputy commissioner, et cetera, that could go to the Department of Human Resources for an administrative remedy. Right. If, but you might find facts, make recommendations. You might be able to alleviate concern because, or say that something doesn't rise to the level of conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. Potentially, but right now, the, the way it stands today before this bill, the State Ethics Commission can issue advisory opinions on sort of just the, the plain requests from people, but you don't really have any ability to hold hearings or investigate today, right? right? And advisory opinions are only, um, we can only accept requests from people when it's um, the request is by their own behavior. So we can't take them in the form of a complaint. We can't issue an advisory opinion related to complaint. So what this would do is provide a level of transparency when we do have findings that it can be made public. And also just find that uh, third party objectivity um, that, you know, is missing in the process now that a lot of people are concerned about. So I'm not saying that, you know, people are not investigating complaints currently, not objectively, but I think there's concern out there. Right? But we hear from people who are interested in filing complaints that their complaint won't be uh, treated objectively if it goes directly back to their home agency. So in this scenario, we would handle the investigation and recommendations part and the home agency would handle the enforcement. So how, who's the home agency and what happens to a state legislator? So it would go back to that, um, one of the ethics panels. And then what? Then we have to the ethics panel to handle it. Which is what they do now, right? They handle the entire process now. So, you know, to be honest, I, I'm going to talk about it a bit later, you know, in the initial stages, we're going to have to be very careful just in terms of resources about what types of cases we accept for investigation. So we're really going to be looking at cases where there is no viable referral alternative. I, think, I can go through it, I think, maybe better when I testify. But for right now, we're going to be really looking at cases that fall squarely under the code of ethics rather than, you know, a mix of the code of ethics and other personal policies or other policies that exist. And where there really is not a viable avenue for a partial investigation. Or no avenue, because there are cases where there's no avenue for investigation or enforcement right now. I'm still not seeing a solution to whatever problem you're trying to solve. I'm not seeing a problem and I'm not seeing a solution here. So maybe your testimony later will help me. Put a pin in it and come back to it. Representative Cooper, go ahead. Uh, Yesterday, the people that took tens in us were here in the card room where we should get back up. <laughs> Not pins in us, pins in the idea. <laughs> in the wording in section 10. Oh, I actually punctured you. There we go. The wording in section 10, with, with or without receiving a complaint, uh, prior to that, unethical behavior is alleged by somebody, something, some entity. Um, this body is going to have the ability to self police us. Self initiate. Uh, yes. As currently written, they can receive a complaint and then initiate an investigation, or if no complaint is received, but for example, something is in the paper. They can take it upon themselves to initiate an investigation. So Representative Byron shows up in a pink pickup truck and there's no disclosure on his form that says he's been selling Mary Kay for a while. Um, and <laughs> it's, it's I appreciate you know. <laughs> them to do something? To the extent that that conduct would constitute unethical conduct. Yeah. Be lack of disclosure. 
Perhaps, I'm not sure it's yeah. about the yeah. okay. details of the hypothetical. And I can say that financial disclosures are regularly investigated while they're being some of their sort of sheets. So the way that you just described is something that I think the ethics commission would be unlikely to investigate given limited resources and something that would be in a situation where someone is shooting an investigation. Uh, is there a record of the complaints or are they confidential? The everything is confidential um, until there's certain stages um, which um, certain documents may become uh, public. <laughs> everything is confidential until um, after an investigation is completed. Uh, then if the commission determines that a hearing is warranted, then the investigation from the court is drafted and that is made public. And also notices um, uh, provided to the um, uh, parties as one is going to come uh, be scheduled. But those would be public as well. Um, then, if uh, but if it's uh, if no hearing is warranted, uh, then the parties are notified, but everything else remains confidential. It's exempt from the Public Records Act. Um, similarly, for the hearing, uh, hearings are public um, with the potential of some of the hearings being conducted in executive session, um, much like regular open meetings law, public records would uh, interplay as normal there. Um, if, and then, so any evidence introduced publicly, public, how could you get that the reps? Um, then any recommendations would also be public records as well. But the de facto here is set um, as uh, confidential. And actually there's some uh, preambulatory language that gets to the confidentiality um, and that is on, sorry, later part of the bill, this is, here we are, page 26, that speaks to the intent. Uh, there is an intent section, this is section 14, 3 VSA 2131, new section to be added. And uh, it's okay with the chair, I'll just read through this here. I think it provides some good um, uh, context for this conversation here. Uh, is the intent of this section to both protect the reputation of public servants from public disclosure of frivolous complaints against them and to fulfill the public's right to know any unethical conduct committed by a public servant that results in issued warnings, reprimands, or recommended actions. And then we get into the substance of the law. I think that. Thank you. The see. Um, and then I should just say quickly that the remainder of the bill, parts five through nine, have been unchanged with the exception of uh, section 18, which is as uh, what's almost, I think, really a technical correction. It's just correcting a, a statutory cross reference in that. But I'd be happy to go through that. So Joe, what? Yes, what I, what I think I'd like to do uh, is just take uh, 10 minutes or so before we break and switch gears uh, to have Executive Director Sivrit maybe respond to some of the, the thoughts that we had today. And then we're gonna pick this back up tomorrow afternoon when the Secretary of State's office coming in um, and can dive into it more, uh, more then. Chris, would you like to switch places with Mr. Devlin and if we, we got deeper into the weeds on some of the stuff than I thought we would today. <laughs> but, um, going over to draft, but I think it was important to, to get some of the concerns on the table. So uh, feels like a bit of a slog, but I think it was, I think we're making progress here on at least identifying where the spots are that we're going to have to. And I'll try, I'll try and be quick. And TJ is also here, I think, to answer um, questions as well. And so I just say, when it comes to financial disclosure language, I think that we didn't really have any comments on the changes. We think it looks pretty good. Our two minor comments would just be $25,000 is on the high side. So if you were to consider anything, I might consider lowering it a bit because $10,000 tends to be the upper limit. Um, and also there's some language that talks about um, when it comes to disclosing, uh, let's see, investments held by a candidate or a candidate's spouse or <laughs> to the best of the candidate's knowledge, the phrasing could kind of create a loophole um, where people are saying, well, I'm not gonna open my football statement list this year from the broker, so therefore I don't know. So we would suggest potentially uh, tightening, tightening up that, that language a little bit. And TJ um, has some examples, but uh, I think talking about, you know, the concept of impossibility, 
also the concept of legal concept of known or should have known just so that we're not creating a situation where people can quite easily get out of that by just deciding proactively not to look into their finances or, you know, and choosing not to talk to my spouse about uh, this particular matter. Um, so those were really our only comments when it came to the financial disclosure language. I'll say that we're really happy to see um, the county office now includes the office of assistant judge, um, high bailiff and uh, probate judge. We don't think that there should be um, exceptions to financial disclosure if you're covering one category of candidate, in this case, candidates for county office, it should count um, everyone. And I can give you actually an example because I know people were looking for examples where financial disclosures can be useful. So about a year ago, we did get a complaint from somebody, a tenant in a multi-unit building. Um, their building had been purchased by a new landlord who was creating conditions where they felt were trying to drive the, the existing tenants out who lived there for a long time so that they could raise the rent. And uh, the tenants were considering bringing a lawsuit against the landlord for the conditions that existed. And apparently the landlord repeatedly referenced a local judge who was his business partner, whether it was in this particular endeavor or not in this particular endeavor, we don't know. Was he really a business partner? We don't know, but they use that repeatedly as a threat, it's telling this person, according to the person you called me, that if you bring this lawsuit, it's not gonna go anywhere because it's either gonna be, go before the judge who's my business partner, or he just knows everyone in the courthouse and so they're not gonna do anything with it. Whether this was you know, a valid thing this person was saying, whether there was truth behind what the landlord was saying, we just don't know. But if there had been a financial disclosure out there, that was uh, publicly available, then at least we would have known um, whether we would have some clues as to whether there was merit to um, statements that the landlord was making. Um, so moving on, we I did before you move on on the financial disclosure piece. I know Representative Higley had a question about the um, specifically about for self-employed people things for consumers around the, uh, the client language on the disclosure. Right, and thank you. Um, and, and I appreciate that we put in there for whom the candidate knows. Um, because, you know, in, in my small business as a contractor, I definitely don't question an individual who um, possibly his job for over $10,000 and say, you know, <laughs> do you have any? So, so I, I, I'm, I'm glad to see that piece. I think, you know, that piece is in there for other folks. It, it could certainly be a way out to say, I didn't know. Um, and then going down to section B, um, uh, naming the client who um, I have received uh, $10,000 or more on a job. Um, I guess the first question I ask is, what, what good would just a person's name do? Um, and I guess, second of all, I can give you an example. Maybe um, um, if I had to divulge an individual's name, what right does that individual have to say that they won't, don't want my, their name divulged? And I can maybe give you an example of an individual who was very low income, had a grant to have all their windows and doors replaced in their job. Or was going to do the job, and they and if I told them that I would have to disclose their name in regards to that job, and they said I don't want people knowing that I had a grant because of my low income to replace all the doors and windows. Right, and I say you know that, that type of situation where they're a grant recipient. Well, I don't want to get ahead of myself. TJ, do you have anything that you'd like to say there? Because I think you're more of an expert than I am when it comes to these kind of questions. No, and it's a that's an excellent question. Um, the the way that other states have dealt with that is to have uh, carve outs for confidentiality if if those types of circumstances come up, or have the client weigh in on whether they want their uh, information disclosed. At the end of the day, though, uh, in, in my experience, those those situations are are relatively rare, in terms of reporting, where there's a, a bona fide reason that the client uh, uh, doesn't want the name disclosed. No client really wants their name disclosed, but it's the the bona fide reason behind it that that uh, is the rarity. Well, if I could just follow up, uh, I live in a very rural Northeast Kingdom of Vermont, and there's plenty of characters that don't want their name or address or anything divulged for any reason. I mean, you know, as a listener, <clears throat> I've had people basically threaten me to not have a name. E911 address. Well, again, I think it <clears throat> should be understood as far as 
<clears throat> excuse me, what, you know, rural characters sometimes we have to deal with. It may, it may be to the detriment of some, you know, rural small contractors or whomever um, to not receive a job because they don't, they don't want their name to vote. So again, it's a, it is a concern. Yes. One, one of the things I heard loud and clear from Representative Hango was this idea that the employer of public servants like us um, is something that is important for the public to know. And I'm wondering, Director Sivrit, if there's a way for self-employed people to kind of get at, you know, who, who are their employers um, without necessarily capturing, you know, every person that, uh, you know, if I build houses, is it important for the disclosure to know, like, everybody that I did a, a small reno for, or are we really talking about, uh, is it to, is it, do we really want to focus for the purposes of this legislation on the, um, you know, for instance, like an attorney that works in the legislature that has a client that has business before a commission or, you know, is bidding on state contracts or something like that. I mean, that's obvious. Those are obviously the cases what they were really trying to get at. Not necessarily somebody who is like received a small grant from the state to improve their house. And then you're somehow looking on it as a contractor. Um, I do think one way to potentially address, address that is you could consider raising the limit of $10,000 to capture situations where there's more money at stake and you're more likely to bring in, not bring in those kind of like smaller situations where you're um, naming, you know, every client you put in windows for. Um, but again, it's also, you you have to know that the client has business with the state. I mean, that's what we're getting at here. We're not asking you to go out and survey everyone. And you also don't have to disclose the nature of that business. And so that's that's an extra layer of protection here where you're not, you know, revealing only the name. You're not saying why they received money from the state. You're not receiving, revealing anything about what you what you did for them. So it's just the name and no more than that. So, you may have, yeah, input too. Sorry. So thinking about a neighbor in my town who builds homes for a living. And we live near a ski resort. So a lot of people have second homes. We're also on the Canadian border. A lot of people have second homes. What, what if that neighbor who's the builder builds a home and homes are not cheap these days. So it's obviously going to trigger whatever threshold we set for a dollar now for someone. Um, and all we know is the contract that we have with this person. We don't know this person personally who's building the second home. We don't ask questions. Well, what do you, what do you do for a living and who do you work for? And what, what contracts have you gotten? What if that person happens to have had business with the state of Vermont and clearly they're well off enough that probably their business is very um, profitable and they've actually had a big contract with the state of Vermont, but we, we, the builder, my neighbor has absolutely no idea that this person got a contract from the state of Vermont, for instance. Then you don't have to disclose it under the language that is written now. If you don't know, then you don't have to disclose it. But it almost feels like that builder now has to ask their clients, well, what do you do for a living? And what what contracts have you had with the state? I mean, I just, yeah, there's once that comes easy. out afterwards, yes. then, then the... Yeah. I think, so... According to the language that's here now, that's not something that you have to ask. So um, I wouldn't feel any pressure to have to ask if it's something where you have a very, you know, arm's length relationship with this person, you don't know anything about them, then you don't need to do a deep dive into their, their personal life when you're filling out the financial disclosure form. I understand the concern that later maybe there'll be a perception and that somebody might complain that the financial disclosure wasn't filled out properly because they assume that you should have known. However, in that case, you, the reason that you're going to give is that, no, I did not know we had a very arm's length relationship. I did not ask them this question and I was not aware of it at the time. Okay, so back to my neighbor who's running for the legislature. Sorry, I forgot to say that. Um, that person, what if they do know? And they do know that their client, what has business with the state, but they don't know the extent of that business with the state. Are they supposed to ask that, no, because that under client? 
under the financial disclosure, you don't have to disclose the nature of the business, just the fact that they do have nature, they do have business with the state. Because what you're looking at here is the nature of your relationship. So you understand that they do business with the state, but you're not, you don't have to go further than that. You're, for the purposes of this disclosure, you just want to you know that they have business with the state. If that's all that you know, then that's enough. Okay, so then that person, the client who's building the home, why would they want to expose themselves to the public and have the the person running for the legislature who's a builder build their house? Why wouldn't they just choose somebody else so they don't have to go through all that and have their name put out there in the public? I mean, really, this is an invasion of some people's privacy who have nothing to do with the candidate running for office. Just like I think Representative Hooper might have alluded to a spouse or domestic partner who is not the person running for public office. Why does that person have to have their personal business exposed to the public? What, what relevance is that? The underlying reason is that the financial interests are inter intertwined. I understand that. However, I think we're hearkening back to an, the old days when one spouse had control over the finances of another and one and that spouse is, and typically it was women, that spouse would be beholden to the, the husband who had the financial control. And I, I feel like this is going back in time and saying, just because my spouse makes money doing such and such, that's influencing me and my decisions. And I really take offense to that type of situation. And I'm gonna go back to the client building the house, sort of a similar thing. How would they even wanna get involved in this? Oh, you want to move on. I really want to move on. So let's make that comment quick. I want to wrap this up, take a break, and get on to our next thing. I promise we will pick this right back up tomorrow afternoon. But go ahead, go ahead. Well, again, just to further that. So, so let's say you don't have to disclose what the person had for business with the state and municipality and all that. Okay, you didn't know. But again, you go back to the next clause. It says you've got to put their name in there as far as the amount. Well, if somebody found that name and they knew that that individual was, uh, and I won't use a name, but you know, somebody prominent in, in the renewable energy field or whatever. Um, yeah, they, they could, they could then open up a, a, a case I'm assuming basically saying that I believe representative Igley working for this individual is now, you know, going to, going to gain, Specifically from working for this individual, then you'd have an investigation, I would think, into, I mean, if somebody else outside, you know, maybe they saw that name, they said, hey, I know who that person is, and I know all about him, and anyway, I just... Yeah. I think you're actually getting at the heart of the purpose of the disclosure form is to capture the situations where you have, you know, you have a client where you receive a significant amount of income from them, and they have their own personal significant financial interests, and so the idea is to make sure that you know, there's no conflict of interest in official actions that you're taking. So it's to identify the potential conflict of interest. It's not looking at generally speaking, could you potentially you know, represent someone's interest? It's if you have a specific course of action in front of you that could affect that person, is there a conflict of interest or the appearance of one? And so then you would be looking into that very specific set of facts, but not something just very general. Okay. So um, I think what we'll do is, uh, Push pause in our ethics discussion for today since we have witnesses coming in already on the, our next topic. Uh, Thank you. If you're ending this discussion, there was still one unanswered question that I had from back when the director was sitting behind me. What complaints are bringing that you're hearing are bringing the need for this legislation forward? What specific complaints about people running for the state legislature? Specifically at the state legislature or more generally speaking? No, specifically for the state legislature, because we're adding in the piece that state led, um, representatives. Yeah, and executive officers. So it'll apply to everyone who already has to file a financial disclosure, not just candidates. Right, but we're specifically adding in um, a group of folks, a group of candidates who do not currently exist in statute. For county officials, you mean? No, I'm talking about state representatives. 
Well, they already have to file a financial disclosure, so it's yes. just bringing in the, it's changing the nature of the information. Okay, it's so what's disclosure, but not just candidates. It also applies to executive officers and sheriffs and every, everyone who already has to file. Okay, so what form. complaints are you hearing that specifically brought those changes forward in this legislation? Sure. I mean, so there's two reasons we're looking to these changes. One is we're we're looking to upgrade, you know, our ethics framework right now because Vermont is at a very basic phase. But financial disclosure is very much related to the ideas of preferential treatment, which is a violation would be a violation of the code of ethics and conflicts of interest and the appearance of conflicts of interest. And that those are the majority of the complaints that we get into our office are related to those two two topics. I'd say at least seventy percent, possibly more. Um. Thank you for coming. And I just want to go on the record and say I'm all for this. I think it's terrible upon us to get out in front of this, not to wait until there's a problem. Uh, I, I'm all for this. I appreciate the work you've put into this, and, and I hope we can move forward with it. We're going to continue to move forward. I appreciate that, Representative Ricky. Uh, we will hear staff up tomorrow. I think um, I want all of us to. Um, Take a look at the, the draft language, the summary. Um, if there are specific um, ideas, concerns, thoughts, I think there's the potential we can clarify and tighten up the kind of you know, client information that we're looking at. Um, I still think there's a little bit of confusion around that loan language. So I, I think we might want to dig into that tomorrow. And then when we come back next week, uh, potentially see some changes there. You know, I appreciate everybody wrestling with some of the, the harder things here, but to represent Roe with this point, um, I think there's a lot of advantage for all of us across state government. And one of the things I wanted to remind everybody from was when we had Jay Johnson, who was really representing the administration's point of view on here, she made it pretty clear that we're, we would um, not face, we would not get the kind of support that she was able to voice from the administration if we were only having uh, the increased disclosure requirements apply to the executive branch. So what, what our task before us, I think, if we're going to maintain that level of collaboration with the administration is to say, what is sort of good universally for all public servants, whether they're in the legislative or the executive branch, um, and for candidates for some of those elected uh, judicial branch positions, which we've brought in in this draft. So, those are the kind of things that we'll all need to think about. Um, we do have to switch gears. So I, I didn't know we would have as robust a committee discussion as we did today, but I think it was really valuable. Um, I know that we'll continue to line up since we uh, work through some of these ideas and, and some of the pain points that we've identified here, but we'll be back at this with some more testimony and discussion tomorrow. Um, so committee, let's take a 10 minute break. So welcome back to the House Committee on Government Operations and Military Affairs. We're doing this half of our morning here uh, and taking up um, the report back on uh, the report about courthouse security that we had ordered uh, in S17 Act 30 for the So, welcome. welcome. If you want to introduce yourself for the record. Thank you, Thank you so much. Jim <clears throat> McCarthy, Terry Corso, State Court Administrator. And I'm joined by our Director of Security at the Judiciary, Robert Shaw. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And we, <clears throat> we thought what we would do, we had submitted the report um, back when it was due uh, December 1, 2023. I did attach a copy of it as well, but um, we're basically going to summarize the report for you and then we're here to answer any questions. I was gonna provide some background to the report and then Rob was going to talk about the specifics of the three recommendations that were made at your directive in terms of the report. And then Greg Mosley, he's our Chief of Finance and Administration is here to answer any questions about the budget numbers. And one of the requests was a budget, uh, a budget request in conjunction with the directive. And then Judge Zoni is going to give just a, a judge's perspective on courthouse security in general. So what we were going to do and want to leave time certainly for uh, the persons with whom we uh, consulted in preparing the report, including the Sheriff's Association, the SCA, and I think Annie is Annie participating for the uh, State's Attorneys and Sheriff's Office. They were the primary stakeholders, but we thought we'd kind of just um, explain it as best we could and then see what, what questions you might have. That sounds great. Great. I think everybody should have your slide deck up by now. So S17 included a variety of components, but there was one specific, specifically directed to the judiciary. And it directed us to submit this report by December 1 that addressed three specific topics. One was the number of sheriff deputies needed for reasonable court security operations. 
Two, any recommendation regarding the creation of a classified position that would be needed to achieve that recommendation for security levels. And three, whatever the corresponding budget request would be for those, for those recommendations. So um, again, by way of just brief background, and I don't know if you've had a chance to review the report. I also sent a memo that just kind of summarizes the report that um, uh, Andrea has, and then we have these slides that even further summarize it. So it's hopefully there are enough uh, different formats to, um, to follow. <clears throat> in essence, the Vermont Supreme Court is responsible for courthouse security, both per the Vermont Constitution and a variety of different statutes. Historically, sheriff deputies have provided the primary means of security for courthouses for centuries. And then more recently, in recent decades, because of basically um, workforce reduction in sheriff uh, forces, we've had to supplement courthouse security with private security and with also state court officers. So right now, there's a combination of those three different um, um, types of personnel. In 2014, the legislature directed the judiciary to do a courthouse security assessment. And I wasn't with the judiciary then, but I get the sense from the legislation that they were looking to actually reduce costs for courthouse security. So in conjunction with that directive, we had the National Center of State Courts do an overview of courthouse security, uh, an overview of courthouse security assessment. And the assessment basically had the opposite conclusion. It said that there are, there are serious challenges here and you need to increase security versus decrease it. I think there was an effort to potentially reduce security costs and a suggestion that, well, maybe you don't need security if there isn't a hearing happening in the courthouse that day. That was, I think, the premise for this assessment. But the assessment did lead to very appointed um, recommendations uh, in terms of uh, adequate courthouse security. And we did make, I say we, I wasn't with the judiciary then, but requests were made to increase courthouse security. Those requests were not approved. The legislature did significantly increase the amount of salary paid to sheriffs uh, in the last couple of years. Um, and we were able to um, incorporate a number of the security measures that were recommended in the assessment as well, including the digitization of courthouse monitors, screens, screening uh, devices at every entrance, every public entrance to courthouses, whether it's the metal detectors or the x-ray machines, the wands, um, duress buttons, um, incident reporting system. Uh, a, a variety of measures have been taken, have taken place to bring and the world has worked very hard and very creatively uh, with law enforcement, including, for example, the federal courts which are very well resourced, if they are upgrading their, their x-ray machines, we've been successful being able to get kind of cast offs, but it's much better than what we had. So there's been very steady improvement in the security measures that have been implemented at the courthouse, I'm very, I'm very happy to say. So in conjunction with the S-17 directive that said that we're to report to you on the numbers of courthouse security staffing um, and um, any new classified positions, Ralph and I visited each of the 23 state courthouses over the past summer. And it was a very, very useful exercise to be able to speak with court staff, speak with judges, speak with local stakeholders in terms of the security situation in each courthouse. And as you can imagine, it varies quite a bit. We have courthouses where you, uh, you know, in terms of busyness, courthouses that have 400 cases a year up to courthouses that have 9,000 cases a year. So there's a lot of uh, difference and variation, and we recognize that security circumstances vary. So it was really useful to go to each courthouse, assess their situation, get their recommendations. Uh, and it was also um, uh, very uh, helpful to consult with the Sheriff's Association, with the Vermont State Employees Association, with the Department of Sheriffs and State's Attorneys as well to get their perspectives. And we want to thank them very much for, we had a series of meetings with them, series of drafts, different options discussed, and they were extremely collaborative and cooperative, and it was really a pleasure uh, working with them. Once we had then um, a, a draft uh, about which we had general consensus, we then did also meet with other frequent court user stakeholders, BGS, Department of Corrections, Department of Mental Health, Department of Family, or, uh, Children and Families, um, Vermont Bar Association, Vermont Legal Aid, Office of Child Support, those groups that oftentimes have um, representatives in the courts. So they've all um, reviewed what was ultimately submitted to you um, on December 1, and, and 
we really, you know, thank you for the, uh, the impetus to, uh, to, to go through that exercise. In the course of gathering all of that input, I wanted to just kind of highlight the basic factors that inform the recommendations. One has to do with security personnel roles, which you wouldn't necessarily have any familiarity with if you're not, you know, at the courthouse day in and day out. But there are three major levels, if you will, of, of security roles. One is the screener, and that's the person who's at the main entrance. They play a very critical role, and that is to prevent weaponry from entering the courthouse or anything that could be used, um, you know, to, to cause harm. So that's kind of like the first line of defense, and that would be the screener. And then in the courtrooms themselves, as hearings are taking place, a court, a court uh, officer presence to ensure that there's decorum, to ensure that if anybody's you know, getting out of turn, that they can control it, de-escalate, respond to it appropriately. And then the other role is what is called a rover. And that would be security personnel who's around the building, inside the building and outside the building, able to respond as needed within the building. Also, we may have, for example, people who turn themselves in um, at the courthouse to be able to take people into custody if need be or a judge's direction. So those are the three main types of security roles. Then there are different levels of security risk. Uh, and just kind of in a nutshell, it's primarily in, first, first of all, persons in custody that you would have typically the most risk. They have an incentive to want to escape, for example. Transport deputies do accompany anybody that's in custody for whatever type of hearing, criminal, family, probate, civil, whatever the person is there for. The other, um, but primarily uh, incidents, if you look at the incident reports, it's more in criminal uh, hearings and family hearings that you have the highest incidence. And that includes also juvenile, juvenile is part of the family uh, docket. Civil, it can depend. You might have, for example, a landlord tenant case or certainly in a stalking case where there would be a risk, a higher <coughs> potential threats. Um, probate, Judicial Bureau, Environmental Division, much less so. But recognizing that the circumstances could vary such that security personnel might be needed in any, in any division, in any type hearing, in any type day. And that's one thing that Rob and his team, you know, are tuned into every day, checking in to see is there any need to be attentive to the need for greater security in this courthouse for whatever reason on that particular day. The other um, level can vary in terms of type of hearing. Now that we're in the remote hearing world, you have in-person hearings, you have remote hearings, and you have hybrid, where some people are in-person, some persons are remote. Certainly in-person hearings would pose the highest potential threat. If it's a remote hearing, much less, <laughs> if any. So that's also a factor in terms of determining what is needed. Ultimately, it's up to the judge in each individual courtroom to determine what level of security is needed. So for example, if it's somebody in the civil docket, where normally you wouldn't have a court officer in each and every hearing, if they anticipate because of the litigants involved or the nature of the case or the hearing, they may say we need additional security and that's where Rob steps in to figure out you know, where can I pull people. So those are, that's kind of it in a nutshell, the factors. And just in general, we have a court officer, a security officer in every criminal and family hearing, in person or hybrid. If it's civil, probate, judicial bureau, environmental division, it's in any hearing as needed and typically judge directed. Court staff may also you know, tip off saying, okay, we anticipate some issues here just from whatever interactions they've had with the litigants up to that case. So that's kind of the background for what factors went into a determination of what level of staffing is needed, what level of security works. So based on all the input from speaking with, meeting with the judges, the court staff, and the stakeholders, um, Rob can now kind of give you an overview about the, the three recommendations. The first having to do with the uh, recommendation regarding the number of security positions and roles, and then the second one regarding a classified position. Thank you, Terry. Um... Just for some additional background, prior to COVID, just about a half a million visitors came to our Vermont courts. Uh, after COVID, where we initiated the new hybrid of remoting, um, we now see a increasing, an increasing rate of attendance of visitors to our courts. It's a much lesser percentage currently. Um, however, what we've also noted is that there are incident report numbers that suggest threatening behavior or incidents where security um, had a circumstance that was identified uh, as an issue have continued to climb. So for the period of uh, 2023, 
we received 910 reported incidents um, from security personnel related to courthouse operations. Now those can range from uh, issues uh, with structural mechanics of the building that could impact security to screening issues to actual um, confrontations, disorderly conduct, violence within the courtroom um, from, from litigants as part of uh, court procedures. So the risks are still much um, very present for us. Uh, if we look back even to 2018, um, we had 311 reported incidents. Um, so our reporting mechanisms have certainly um, been fine-tuned to um, being more comprehensive um, in 2024. But what I am seeing in terms of our risk numbers is that those are steadily increasing. So commensurate with that and with our statewide tour and with all the valued input, uh, we arrived at some uh, conclusions where we need to uh, re reorganize our protective capacities within the courts. Um, so at this point, we're looking at 47 armed uniformed sheriff deputies. Now, when we talk about sheriff deputies, these are certified law enforcement officers capable of investigations and arrest powers. Um, these are essential elements to have within our courts. Um, as Terry had, had spoken to, we have individuals who present on warrants or taken into custody, um, and we have disorderly conduct or violence where we need law enforcement intervention, and having those officers on site uh, is, is important. Balancing that, um, and in those roles, the, the rover, as Terry had talked about earlier, is an, an essential element because there is so much variation in court security needs within our buildings from individuals who are taken into custody, who are placed in a detention area, um, to uh, reissuing citations, um, cite and release circumstances for individuals who presented the court on, say, a warrant, and then they're released. Uh, we need a law enforcement capability and the rover position of ISA allows us and provides us that latitude uh, to provide those services. Additionally, um, we do have some circumstances in the state where we do have deputy sheriffs working within the courtrooms, which has historically worked well. Uh, and those are mechanisms we would seek to in some degrees continue, but there's a balance to that where we're really interested in shifting the law enforcement presence to the front of the access points to the courthouses, where the largest risks would present uh, if someone were wanting to, um, to, to be frank, attack a courthouse. So the recommendation is that we would increase um, some of our armed uniform deputy sheriffs from numbers, and Greg can speak to this in, in a, a few minutes, and then we would also balance that with uh, 33 judiciary, what we call plain closed court security officers. And these are state employees who receive special training for court operations and the court functions within the courthouse. We look at court operations as the front of the house and the back of the house. There's screening operations and protection and roving. And then there's the courtroom operations, which is a complex process uh, of ensuring that um, the litigants, the lawyers, the judge, the jury, um, the visitors, um, and court staff all are coordinated uh, in a, a manner within the hearing and that security is maintained at all times within these hearings. So with that adjustment, we additionally have another model of where we, <coughs> due to COVID, had to implement uh, a series of what we refer to as regional court security officers who travel around the state based on um, security needs that can arise um, on a schedule a week before or within hours of uh, an occurrence. So with COVID, we still have the routine uh, individuals who are out sick, who are unavailable, um, and then we have additional court uh, hearings, jury draws, uh, and jury trials, which are resource um, needy. And so this uh, resource of having five personnel who are able to travel around the state and they're in force today uh, and are often in different courts on a daily basis has become an absolutely uh, highly successful venture on the part of the judiciary. And it's something that is definitely recommended 
um, within uh, S17. And as part of that, uh, we have one, two existing um, court security managers uh, who have some regional responsibilities, primarily Costello and the Supreme Court. And they also oversee training and operational training of new sheriff's deputies, new um, private security currently, and all of our new state of, of Vermont employees as we're able to hire them. Um, we are, my mission at the, at the judiciary is to create a defined court standard for all levels of security that we have in the building. And whether that's a contracted sheriff's deputy all the way through a state employee, we want to have the, the ability to have the same expectations uh, of their skills and abilities. Um, so we do have training managers who are out there um, now providing uh, remote as well as in-person training uh, on a consistent basis to support the court security effort. So, so that was the first recommendation in terms yes. of number of personnel. And then the second one is the new classified position. Right. So, similar to law enforcement and in all of security, we continue to have uh, a significant challenge in hiring. Um, and that goes on today. In the past week, uh, we've had, for example, three individuals who had applied for state classified security positions, uh, pursue other jobs because um, we need to have a, a more solid level position to provide them. So <clears throat> part of this recommendation would be to uh, hire at a new pay grade level um, specific court security, these specific court security positions and have a training expectation that they um, complete a larger degree of security training that we ought prior to uh, or in less than what we offer today to our current state of Vermont personnel. <clears throat> Additionally to that, we're seeking to enhance their capabilities for what's called wow. non-lethal use of the word capabilities to have statutory protections so that in the function of their job, which they do today, um, with the same risk and danger levels, they have the, the capacities to provide protection to the visitors, to themselves, to the courtroom uh, and court personnel within the building. So this is a, a new expansion. Um, it would be in the non-lethal use of force we're not trying to create a law enforcement entity. We would utilize law enforcement level training to support uh, this new position, uh, which I think, um, again, given our risk levels, uh, is something that uh, makes complete sense. And these state court officers would strictly have a security role in hearings, in courtrooms, in hearings. It would also include a component which right now is lacking, whereby if there's not a hearing, if the hearing gets continued, if the hearing ends early, they are also authorized to fulfill administrative functions so that there's no dead time. They're trained to do the security, that's their primary function, but if they're assigned to a hearing uh, to a courthouse and there are no hearings for whatever reason, because it happens, hearings end early or they might be continued, whatever, but they have the ability to, to perform administrative tasks. And we would, I'm thinking, expungement, something that you can pick up, put down quickly, but be productive during that time. So that's built into this new classified position to, to offer that, that uh, level of productivity and flexibility. So that's the second, um, the second point. That's the third has to do with the budget request related to those recommendations. And you have then um, the figures, it's basically would result in 18 new positions. And I don't know if Greg wanted to get into specifics or if you wanted us to kind of delve into the, the, the total budget uh, request or? I think we can see from the slide deck, because uh, I was certainly skipping ahead <laughs> as you were talking. That's yeah. always the danger of giving us the slides. So I no, recognize that. Um, but yeah. Uh, I think it, it might be good to orient the committee to just, you know, what we're looking at here and what that and is you. for across the hall. Okay, did you want Greg to come up for that then? And maybe Greg and then Judge Zoni, because Judge Zoni was then going to talk about the judge perspective for security, Greg. Yeah, I think that sounds great. So, uh, Greg, you want to come up uh, first and just walk us through the quest. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, please. He likes that extra pork. I, I appreciate that, endorse that fully. Oh, 
For the record, my name is Greg Mosley, I'm the Chief of Finance and Administration of the Judiciary. Tom Tone, Chief Superior Judge. And in terms of um, the, the position numbers of the budget, uh, I'm kind of open to whatever questions you may have. Uh, this does increase the footprint of our statewide security force for all of our courthouses. We have 23 courthouses. Most counties have two, uh, some have one. Uh, Washington County has three. And um, we currently have 69 FTEs, and Terry mentioned that some of those are deputies, some of those are employees, and some of those are private security, but 69 total FTEs. This, these, this recommendation would be to increase that by a net of 18 positions to 88 uh, FTEs for 23 courthouses. Um, we are recommending that we not use private security guards. Uh, that is supplemental and used only when necessary, when we can't get employees or deputies where we need them. So this recommendation proposes no private security. And um, we currently spend in our budget uh, $6.8 million on either positions or contracts for security. This would, uh, these recommendations would increase that by about $2 million. So it would be Point eight million total, and uh, I'll take questions. I think on on the numbers that there are. Then we're looking at numbers on who. Sure, thanks for coming in. And Mark, this is part me too. Uh, in Wyndham County, we went through a, a transition several years ago where the, there wasn't the kind of money needed to continue to pay the sheriffs who were <laughs> providing the, the security. And so a private firm was brought in. I, I think there's, there's now uh, sheriff's deputies in the courthouse now. But what I hear you saying is that wouldn't be the case. Privates would not be in there. And I forget the name of the company. Security. Uh, um, and this would then be state money paying for this, or, or rather than... Uh, was the money previously coming from the county? No, those came from the state. Okay. The, the funding for courthouse security all comes from the state. Okay. All general fund. So I'm just trying to make sure we don't run to another situation where we bring in the sheriff and at some point, uh, I guess, whatever the budget constraints were, they, they forced uh, that to change. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, yeah, that was uh, happened around 2016, um, and we uh, we contracted for a firm to come in. It started just in Wyndham, but uh, they are now operating in, in uh, four or five counties at about six different courthouses because of other gaps um, that have been uh, risen. And um, right now, uh, you know, in Wyndham, they're operating pretty well. There's there's a uh, an economy of scale. There's I think five positions. Security guards. And there's a supervisor, and, and it's working well. But there's other places in the in the state where they might just one person at a courthouse, and um, you know that's not the situation. We'd rather have law enforcement. Uh, and if I could follow up, just to to say that uh, I think coming from a perspective of someone who worked in family services and is still a guardian ad litem in court, uh, what I understand is, uh, let's say a child has to be brought into custody at a hearing. The sec private security people are not able to do that. They have to call if there's not a certified law officer there at the time. Is that accurate? Yeah, the, the guards do not hold people in custody. They can restrain in the situation, um, but we really need law enforcement to right. do that. Yeah, so that is That's a, limitation. a detriment to having them there, whereas... Yeah. Law enforcement team can take care of those situations right then. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sorry, I am I'm so sorry. I skipped over Representative Cooper. My apologies, nope. Representative Higley. I'm going to make sure I'm doing air traffic control here. Go ahead, Representative Cooper. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I don't know who will answer this. <clears throat> the people that are on private security and the anticipated state employees have what training at this point? Are they certified in any way? Do they carry anything? Are they anything other than the person that sits up in the left-hand side of the court and watches things go on? Do they have any ability to quell 
anything that's happening inside the courtroom. And the second part of the uh, question is, several years ago, somebody was murdered in the courthouse parking lot in Barry. What substantive changes have been made that would have prevented that? Well, the first part of your question, uh, our employees, uh, our, the state employees do not carry weapons. They're not certified to carry weapons. Um, they, in a private job, they might have been a police officer or something and have been trained, but that's, you know, that's not something that we provide. They don't carry weapons. They are trained in de-escalation and court procedures. Um, they are trained to run the, uh, the security equipment up front, the screening equipment, um, and that's it. They're not armed. Uh, the private security guards are armed. They do carry a weapon. They are certified um, with the Secretary of State. Uh, they've gone through uh, significant training in restraints and handcuffs and guns, um, and they are armed. We have 10 of them throughout the state. Um, and then, of course, there's the uh, the, the uh, county deputies, and they've gone through police training. So when I say armed, I'm not restricting myself to a firearm. Yeah, we, our employees do not carry tasers, batons, anything like that. And the second part? Uh, what was the second part again? Well, the more important part, a couple of years ago, somebody was murdered. In oh, yeah, uh, our very What have we done to change that? I, I thought that was a state office building. I don't believe there was a place in the courthouse yeah. parking lot right out there. Oh, really? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so in terms of the courthouse, um, we do have uh, eyes outside the courthouse. Now we have this, the newer security cameras uh, cover parking lots, sidewalks, all of the entranceways. Um, and our rovers, where we have them, are able to roll around the building and cover the grounds. Um, and that's, that's uh, the extent, I think, of our exterior monitoring. Unless Rob has something to add to that. No, that's uh... Digital camera system. Yeah. 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 So, so we, we do have digital camera systems that um, now have exterior and internal public surveillance areas, and there there are access points within the buildings where those are monitored, and there's uh, there's more than one per building. So at this point, you're differentiating between a courthouse that's in a state building as opposed to a standalone courthouse in terms of your... Uh, this is the security level for all ah, courthouses, look. and some of the courthouses have executive branch agencies within them. Yeah. Uh, the particular incident you mentioned happened in a state office that was not a courthouse. Okay. So there, I, I don't have any information about the security that they've taken or the changes <laughs> that they've made. Okay. It's, it's, it's uh, thank you. This may be a, a question for the director of security, but um, I think you had mentioned 311 incidents uh, since 2018. Is that correct? In, in 2018, we recorded 311, um, and that has progressively increased uh, essentially through 2024. Uh, for this year, we have 263 to present that have been, been filed. How many did you have in 2023? 2023, we had 910. Prior to that, during COVID 2022, there were 301. Uh, 2021 was 103. And then 2022, 63, which is again a COVID adjustment uh, for remoting. 2019, we had 715 logged uh, security incident reports. Can you give me a range of those incidents? I mean, from Severe to not so severe? Uh, yes, we have, uh, we collect a variety of data points uh, with security incident reports. Uh, anything from inappropriate communications, disorderly conduct, any infractions from uh, an individual or persons um, towards a court that would represent a threat are recorded. Um, other uh, security incidents could be. Uh, if we had a screening system failure, uh, that represents a potential breach. Uh, if we had an escape, um, if we, we we also now have expanded our monitoring to the whole array of social media. Um, so while we do get incident reports regarding um, 
uh, disorderly behaviors, um, those could actually occur outside of a courthouse entirely. Um, so we, we receive threats uh, nationally, internationally, um, locally um, from uh, an array of uh, individuals. Hey, thank you. Sorry. I think if there aren't any burning questions from the committee uh, that we'll hear from other folks, Judge Zoni, did you want to offer more testimony on this before we let you out of the chair? <laughs> sure. Just, just wanted to touch base on when we look at security, uh, oftentimes you don't need it until you do, right? It's like many other things. Uh, we hear about, we have reports, we don't have people who have assaulted judges in the courtroom like we saw it where? In Nevada. Seven million people have watched that video so far, and I suspect many around the table have seen it, whether it's on the evening news or on social media. And what happened in that case was the individual was being sentenced, and he decided that he was going to go after the judge. He comes over the bench. He somehow was able to get around the table, jumps over, and starts beating on the judge and has to be pulled off. His rationale for that stated after the event was he was having a bad day and wanted to kill the judge. We have in our courts every day individuals who are coming to court, and it's not usually by choice. People don't wake up and go, boy, I can't wait to go to court today. It's going to be a, a golden day. People are there because we're dealing with extremely critical and important issues involving child custody. We're involving criminal justice. We have victims coming in, and we have an obligation to assure the security of every one of those individuals coming into our building, as well as the staff and the judges who work in those buildings. That begins at the front door. If someone's coming into that building and they just and they might have a gun on them or they have other weapons on them, at that moment, it's critical to be able to ascertain whether they have a weapon or, and are coming in. If they are caught in that door, there are times where people who were coming in to do something bad, at that moment, even someone who may be experiencing mental issues uh, may recognize the difference between, well, I got one choice. I can either fight my way through to go where I wanted or fight my way out and go the other way. So it, it's a, just because we find the weapons doesn't always mean that everything is going to go smoothly. Then when we're in the room, judges make decisions that might take someone's children away from them. We issue orders that require people to leave their house. We put people in jail. And that are those are stressful, emotional moments. And people get escalated. There can be outbursts. About a decade ago, I was in court. I imposed bail on a gentleman who apparently wasn't happy with my decision. While wearing handcuffs, he flipped over the table. Thankfully, there were two sheriffs standing next to him, and they were able to uh, stop him. But that wasn't so much in my mind, oh, they're going to come harm me. I was worried about the state's attorney standing five feet away, the victim in the courtroom standing back, and other individuals. And so when we talk about security, I think it's important to keep in mind that every day we deal with issues, and it's not just about the judges. It's about the staff, and it's about everyone who comes in because we have an obligation to them. We don't want to have what occurred in Nevada or in Mississippi several years ago when a judge was attacked in the courtroom. The problem we run into, obviously, is that when someone leaves, as uh, Representative Hooper points out, uh, something horrible and tragic can happen outside of the court. But we do what we can. As, as Rob mentioned, there are cameras. If we have someone in the courthouse who there's an escalated cir circumstance, Security will walk them out to their car, and the, the sheriffs we have will assist them in trying to maintain their safety there. And one of the reasons why we don't have the types of incidents that you see in other areas is because we are vigilant. And we also have judges who are trained in de-escalation to try to have a calm and compassionate approach to bring people down when they might be escalated. But if that doesn't work, the security approach that we take is critical. And the S-17 report outlined a strategy and uh, policies that would assure the safety going forward uh, as best we can for everyone who enters our buildings and works in them. So thank you for your consideration. Thank you for being here. Um, and before, uh, I just wanted the committee to know to level set expectations here. You know, this, we're at the beginning of obviously presentations across the hall on FY25 
budget. This is obviously something we ask for feedback on from the stakeholders. Uh, the judiciary has given their testimony. We're going to have some of the other uh, partners um, and stakeholders um, comment on this proposal next. And we'll be asked, of course, to kind of weigh in on the budget recommendation to our colleagues across the hall. We're not going to have that discussion today. Um, but so I just wanted to make sure we kind of got the general concepts. We're reminded about why we asked for this. And I think you've gotten a good sense from uh, Judge Zone and his colleagues of what the ask is and a reminder of why um, now. And so um, I'm hoping that we're able to, uh, you know, come to a conclusion and give a good recommendation over the next, you know, couple of weeks. And if we want to have some of these folks back um, to participate in committee discussion about the future of courthouse security and who should be doing it and where, uh, happy to, um, you know, schedule more time for this in the future if we feel like that's needed before we make a recommendation. So. Thank you, Judge Sonny. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Very much. Um, so next up, uh, Sheriff Anderson, I think uh, happy to take the witness chair. Welcome back. Thank you. Mr. Chair, committee, uh, good morning. For the record, Mark Anderson. I'm Sheriff of Wyndham County. I'm here in my capacity as the president of Vermont Sheriff's Association. I know that this committee has heard it, but I'm gonna say it. Everything with sheriffs is complex. <laughs> we'll start there. Um, I'm actually going to uh, read a, a um, quote from a book called Team of Teams written by a uh, uh, retired army general about the, the words complexity and complex as it relates to this topic. Uh, Edward Lorenz, who's a meteorologist and uh, uh, something else, I forget what, uh, studied at MIT, he said, oh, the butterfly effect is a physical manifestation of the phenomenon of complexity, not complexity in the sense that we use the term in daily life, a catch-all for things that are not simple or intuitive, but complexity in a more restrictive, technical, and baffling sense. This kind of complexity is difficult to define. And those who study it often fall back on Supreme Court Justice Potter Stewart's comment on obscenity. I know it when I see it. Things are complex, <laughs> are, uh, such as living <laughs> ecosystems, national economies. They have a diverse array of connected elements that interact frequently. Because of this density of linkages, complex systems fluctuate extremely and exhibit unpredictability. In the case of weather, a small disturbance in one place could trigger a series of responses to build into unexpected and severe outcomes in another place because of the billions of tiny interactions between the origin and the outcome. Simply put, complicated. We can build like an organizational chart. We can see the connections and complexity. It's a ball of yarn. And so when I talk about the reasons why 2016, we had, uh, in fact, my department uh, withdrawal from providing court security. And later on, we talked about the different complexities that are the macro issues of sheriff's departments. You know about retirement. I'm not going to talk about today other than to say that is one piece of yarn in this ball. Uh, you know about labor shortages across all of Vermont. One more piece of a, a macroeconomic issue that is affecting everyone. And so when I'm competing to employ deputy sheriffs, uh, I'm competing with what Bradboro PD is paying, what the Vermont State Police are paying, what Montpelier PD is uh, paying, even though they are 100 miles away from where I am. So all of these things start to interact with each other as we talk about, well, why? I'm going to save everything else about complexity, and I'm happy to go into details, um, just to say Vermont Sheriff's Association supports the judiciary's proposal. We want to provide security to courthouses. We're not obligated to. In fact, nowhere in the Constitution does it give us the responsibility to do that. It does give the judiciary the responsibility to do that. We are there because we agree to be there because we want to. We see it as part of the mission that we serve. Uh, the economic issues that uh, troubled my department and the judiciary I believe we've done work over the last several years to improve that, and my department returned uh, to providing security in Brattleboro about three years ago, two? 
um, because we were able to recognize that paying $26 to the sheriff's department to pay a reasonable wage, retirement, health care, taxes, equipment, training, and on and on, uh, that wasn't reasonable. And so we worked with the legislature and the judiciary to improve uh, those circumstances. Uh, in other words, an investment was made into court security uh, that helped improve the situations. Have we solved all of them? I don't think so. But this is part of the work that we get to do to, to recognize problems and solve those things. Um, we, during uh, S-17 last year, we talked about a proposal that would have state deputies. Through the work that we did uh, after leaving this committee last year, uh, with the judiciary, with VSEA, uh, with a variety of stakeholders, it started to become clear that we were talking about another complex uh, that involved a variety of different factors that then brought us back to the judiciary's proposal uh, that has been presented to you. We uh, worked with the judiciary to identify uh, efficiencies. And so if we talk in a bottom line sense, we have a revenue column, that's the tax coming in to pay for the service. We have an expense column, that's deputies being uh, employed to provide the service. But then we have a third column, which is resource allocation. And so are there times where deputy sheriffs were used to do administrative tasks that don't require them? Yeah, we wanted to be efficient with the resource that was applied. Is that the best use of a deputy's time? No. And so as we talked with the judiciary and said, it's really hard for me to hire a 0.25 full-time equivalent employee. People who come into law enforcement on a job. It's a career. They're looking for 40 hours a week. When we uh, talk with the judiciary about holidays, well, contract employees don't normally get holidays. That's part of the contract. They said, well, that's fine, but I'm still employing 1.0 FTEs who would anticipate sick time, vacation time, holidays, like any state employee. And so as we start to navigate through a variety of uh, federal and state labor law, uh, or uh, labor expectations, uh, we started to come back to a system that was collaborative with the judiciary, collaborative uh, with our employees and our departments uh, to deliver a service that's reasonable for the monitors as well as our court system. I'm kind of the why guy here. I'm happy to talk about proposals of what, um, but I think it's really the judiciary's um, position, uh, or I should say responsibility, identify the security needs. Um, and so we're here to support their needs. We're here to uh, push forward. Uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions. So thank you uh, for the testimony. And, and it looks like there's 7.07 new sheriffs that have been acquired here. Well, realistically, and, and you've mentioned it in the past, and it's uh, hard to come up with uh, uh, new employees. So what, what is realistically, what do you... What do you think about that? The, uh, so a few things. Um, you heard uh, the judiciary speak about the different uh, positions. Uh, and so part of the uh, resource allocation is identifying where do we need sworn law enforcement? The rover position makes a lot of sense because they are responsive to issues as they come up in the courthouse. Uh, the, uh, the front door security, I can train general law enforcement to handle that aspect. And we work with the judiciary to uh, add additional training to front door security. A court officer requires some nuanced training. Um, and we've also historically worked with the judiciary to obtain that training, but it's more of a niche skill set to, to teach. And so working uh, to identify what made sense through this proposal that the judiciary has put forward, we have aligned law enforcement into the full-time uh, equivalent positions that we can take general law enforcement training uh, and with um, a far lower footprint, apply the judiciary specifics uh, to that person. Uh, it's easier for us to uh, recruit and ret uh, retain uh, the individual. Uh, I, I mentioned the retirement bill. We are hopeful that the retirement bill uh, that's before this committee uh, will proceed. We think that that will also be beneficial in helping us retain people as the uh, Treasurer's Office mentioned the pension system's designed to be a retention uh, tool, uh, so we are uh, pull pull. That's an issue that affects roughly half the departments in the state, so some departments are okay, and some departments are saying, we're really hoping for this. 
Um, we have uh, we have had good communications with the judiciary in being able to explain what our pressures are uh, to say this year we are at um, uh, this amount of money and this is what it costs to stay in business. I just learned Brattleboro PD raised their rates uh, for their initial hiring and next year I might have a different conversation uh, that needs to be had. And so this is part of that ball of yarn that keeps getting tugged on it um, is seen across the state. Um, one agency starts offering a, a sign on bonus. I'm competing to keep my employee. Uh, so there's some macro level issues that affect law enforcement, but they also affect other businesses. What we know is that when we offer good wages, when we offer uh, sustainable benefits, uh, when we treat people well, uh, in the context of employment, but also in the well uh, or in the context of um, good training and support uh, from within their organization, we see retention. So uh, I'm hopeful law enforcement, as it starts to uh, build momentum in hiring, uh, we see that industry improve. Thanks. Representative Cooper, and then I want to make sure we have time for our other witnesses. I'm going to try to speak quickly. Have we talked about the actual, you go to New York City, you go in the subway, you got transit police, you go to the, you go to the we talked about actually establishing some kind of an actual force that would be trained at a level that they could accomplish, except for the court officer probably tasks, but still be certified, have authority and not necessarily be full-fledged employee of you or an employee of the court. Have we talked about it? I don't recall, uh, but I'm happy to talk about it now. Uh, the part of uh, the discussions that we had uh, were to create state deputies that would incorporate, um, and we were saying it would identify better access to benefits, pay, uh, and process uh, that would help us recruit and retain. Part of the issue that we ran into was a constitutional issue in that the judiciary is responsible for the court security. And we fall with our state uh, transport deputies, which we are trying to mold that to be a state court officers or state court deputies. Uh, we we're trying to basically say, well, well, let's repeat that system, which came into a constitutional conflict with the executive branch telling the judiciary what to do. And so that was one piece. Then we said, what if we consider putting the state deputies under the judiciary. And so sheriffs would operate in an executive branch and in a judicial branch in terms of supervising the employees, but the two separate branches of government will be responsible for the employees. And as we were looking at it, we're saying the cost to set up the infrastructure to do that doesn't quite make sense because now we're duplicating where we already have the services on one side that we're now carrying over. And so, um, the logical concept to create a, a service that would provide this, such as a judicial marshal, uh, I mean, it's possible, but then it comes with the cost that comes with it, where the yeah. pragmatic self said, okay, but it probably is just easier and more approachable to uh, come back with this proposal. Thank you very much, Sheriff Anderson. I'm sure we'll uh, have more conversation about this topic. <laughs> so thanks for being with us. Thank you for your time. Steve, are you coming up or are you Anton? Speak on. Okay, great. <laughs> May phone a friend if I need help. <laughs> Sounds great. <laughs> Just didn't want to leave anybody out. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. For the record, I'm Steve Howard. I'm the executive director of the Vermont State Employees Association. Um, I want to thank the committee. First of all, I just want to say, having a previous career that brought me every day to work in the Costello Courthouse, um, I understand personally <laughs> how important this issue is. Um, and it's something that is on the top of um, each of our members' minds particularly in the world that we live in that is becoming more unraveled um, as they uh, try to do the work that they're assigned to do. I want to thank the committee for your attention to this critical issue. Um, security of, of state employees and judicial employees is probably the most 
significant responsibility that an employer has. Um, and I, I just want to say, um, I, I think uh, I want to be clear that VSEA, um, the members of the VSEA uh, believe that the current, that the level of security in the courthouses um, and in state office buildings in general, Representative Hooper made reference to the tragedy in Barry, um, is seriously lacking, that it's inadequate, that it's haphazard, that it's disorganized, and it's not prioritized by the management. Um, and so I'm grateful that the committee is willing to take this issue up, even as it just uh, pertains to the courthouses, but it's certainly an issue that could be expanded beyond that to all of the state office buildings throughout the state. In fact, we have, we are supporting a bill H-147 that's currently in the House Institutions Committee that we think does adequately address safety and security in both the, the uh, courthouses and in the state office buildings that essentially, <laughs> what Representative Hooper suggested, and expands the Capitol Police uh, to all state employees. So the, our members would have the same level of authority that legislators have um, when they're doing the important functions of carrying out the laws that, that lawmakers uh, support uh, pass. Um, I would say that um, we're very happy to see that we're moving away from private security. Uh, I think uh, very clearly from our members' perspective, the experiment with Securitas was a failure. They did not have any confidence in, um, in the safety and security provided by Securitas, and they're grateful and happy to see that there's a movement in another direction away from Securitas. Um, we certainly support the additional uh, allocation of deputy sheriffs and of the uh, judicial officer two positions that are recommended in the report. We support additional security personnel um, in the courthouses, along with the three supervisors for the for the um, judicial, judicial off officers, I think where we diverge a bit from the rest of the of the uh, stakeholders is in our view that um, the report doesn't actually deliver on what this committee and what the legislature requested, which was. Um, a recommendation regarding any needed creation of classified positions responsible for courthouse security services. And here's the key, similar to classified positions of transport deputies. Not a lot of leeway in that direction. You don't see that recommendation in this report. And VSCA strongly supports, uh, while we do support the additional staff, we strongly support assigning the deputy uh, sheriffs to the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs, and we support providing that department uh, with additional staffing resources in order to carry out this responsibility. Um, the judiciary can choose to meet its responsibility constitutionally any way it wishes to. In the courthouses ac across the state, uh, the judiciary also has responsibility for maintaining those courthouses, and who does that? BGS staff that works for the executive, because that's how they have chosen to meet their responsibility. And so they can do that with security as well. I want to just comment a little bit on why our members feel so strongly that this, um, that these positions be state positions and that they be allocated to the department and not just to the judiciary. First of all, our members, I think, have been very clear with us um, that they don't have a lot of confidence in the judiciary uh, and their ability to take the security situation, the security uh, environment where we're, we're operating in seriously. Um, just a few examples of late that reinforce that position. So one, um, one of recent, um, a recent situation in the Costello where a, a person was uh, allowed into the, screened into the building um, and allowed to stay over, uh, allowed into the building and then stayed overnight in the courthouse. Uh, was discovered by a BGS janitor at 4 a.m. in the courthouse, scared her half to death. She was there by herself. Um, that's an example of a very serious breach of security, only made worse when the management of the courthouse made light of it and joked about it 
with an email to all of the staff, not exactly building confidence among our members that that administrator took the, their safety and security seriously. Recently, you may have read about the state's attorneys in Chittenden County being evacuated from, their, uh, from the courthouse as a result of a serious threat. Um, our members reported that it took an hour and a half before anybody else in the courthouse knew what was going on. Meanwhile, the person who made the threat was still at large. Nobody communicated to judiciary staff what was going on. The judges seemed perplexed as to what was going on. And people were coming and going uh, from the building without really knowing what was happening. And so that, again, is an example of the lack of communication and a lack of seriousness that leaves our members to believe that we need another entity to manage the safety and security of not just our members in the courthouses, but the public that comes into the courthouses. Um, we also have received complaints from members who serve as judicial assistants, primarily administrative staff that manage the WebEx for, uh, for hearings and do um, you know, really administrative uh, tasks. We got, we've gotten calls from judicial assistants who have been asked to secure courtrooms. <laughs> had no idea how to secure a courtroom. They don't know how they're supposed to protect the judge, but they've been told by the management to go do it. So this is a very serious situation that um, we're very uh, grateful that this committee is willing to take a look at in a long-term way. And we hope that um, we can build upon some of the recommendations in the report of additional resources. Uh, but we also believe that the original position um, that was contemplated in the, in, the, in the legislation that passed was for <laughs> positions similar to state transport deputies, and we support that. And one of the reasons we do is because of what you heard, you heard Sheriff Anderson talk about a little bit here today and was the testimony of the Sheriff's Association last year, that it'd be very difficult to fill these positions if they're contracted positions. And that really the resources of the state are needed in order to attract uh, those folks who wish to make this a career. An example of the retirement that the sheriff raised, a very important issue. State transport deputies are in Group C. They already have the retirement age and benefits that the sheriff see. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. We have a very successful model. And we also understand that the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs needs additional resources. We support those resources. We think they need to have what it is necessary in order to make sure that our members have um, the highest level of security they can have and that our members have confidence that they are safe when they go to work in a courthouse, that they are safe when they attend a hearing at the courthouse, and more importantly, that the that Vermonters who, are, who they serve in those courthouses are also safe. So uh, generally, we, we found working with the judiciary on this report uh, very um, positive. We um, found it to be a very positive process. Uh, but our, our conclusion is different, I think, in this one aspect. Uh, we believe that the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs should expand the state transport uh, program in order to provide resources. Thank you very much. Questions for Mr. Howard. So I, I'll go ahead and write some more. I don't see the testimony here on our website available. My testimony, but uh, I could provide it to you. I'm just doing some notes, but I can be happy to yeah, be helpful. Provide it to you right here. All right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. much. And committee, if we can just hang on for just a few minutes, I wanted to give uh, Annie from the Department of State's Attorneys to Sheriffs an opportunity to give us their thoughts on the recommendations, and then I'm sure we can have folks back as we consider the proposal. Uh, good morning, committee. Um, thanks for uh, inviting me in, um, and thank you for letting me testify remotely. I had foot surgery, so I'm still hobbling around. Um, the position of the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs is that we fully support the judiciary's recommendation for how this security um, would be laid out. Um, 
So similar to our 14 elected sheriffs, we also support the judiciary in this report. So that's the that's the short version of this. I do want to um, mention two or three other quick points. Um, the Department of State's attorneys does not want uh, to take on additional um, transport or uh, security deputies. We do not have the capacity. Uh, I, I think you know, um, as a government operations committee, that our central office is um, very thinly staffed. Um, and we, regardless of you know uh, taking this on, I also agree with Judge Zone um, and the p folks at the judiciary who have talked about the uh, separation of powers issues from the judiciary to the executive branch and then to our folks. Um, I think that does become a problem. I trust um, the judiciary and and Judge Zone and Terry and uh, Corsones and Rob Shell to be able to manage this. So we fully support them. Um, I would also want to just make one correction, which is um, in the situation where our Chittenden, uh, Chittenden State's Attorney staff was escorted out of the building, um, that situation was uh, fully involved. The Vermont uh, Department of Buildings and General Services Safety and Security staff. So if there was a breakdown in communication, it was not because there were no state employees involved in this discussion. In fact, they were um, involved from the get-go uh, with as soon as that situation uh, became known. So, uh, you know, just to summarize, we fully, fully support the recommendation that has come to you from the Vermont Judiciary. And um, just as a side note, we very much look forward to coming to your committee to talk, talk about our budget um, and um, as you're taking up criminal, the criminal justice system uh, staffing. Thank you. Thanks. I know uh, we're running a little over time, but I wanted to, to quickly just ask Annie um, about, it, it seems like we were thinking when we passed S-17 Act 30 that the statewide transportation deputies might be a model. I'm hearing pretty clearly from you that the the stakeholders kind of moved beyond that model. And I think the report, you know, delves into the details, but I just wanted to confirm that the position from DSAS is that, you know, we should go with this report, which has a variety of different recommendations as opposed to. Yes, yes, Mr. Yes, Mr. Chair, exactly. And and um, uh, it was described by uh, Terry Corsones that the stakeholders were very much involved. And that's absolutely true. Um, the sheriffs and our department, uh, were um, uh, met met the judiciary met with us on a number of occasions. They shared all their information. We had uh, meetings uh, direct directly with Greg Mosley, who went over numbers. Um, I, I feel like it was very, very, very thoroughly vetted, and um, so I have I have full confidence in what the judiciary has put forward to your committee. Great. Well, I'm sure we'll be seeing many of you back uh, on this issue and others as we um, pick up some other public safety work as well. Um, we'll um, break for today. Committee, we have a really stacked one to three. Uh, yeah. So please be in your seats at one o'clock.